In the years since the task was adopted, fewer New Yorkers are taking the HSE exam, and the passing rates of those who do, ha of those who do have significantly decreased. While this decline mirrors a national trend, it is important to note that even before this latest decline, New York already had one of the lowest HSE exam passing rates in the country. New York City's performance is among the lowest in the state. In 2015, the city had an overall task passing rate of only 46 percent, and four out of the five counties that had the lowest passing rates in the state were New York City boroughs. The Bronx had the lowest passing rate in the state at 40 percent, and Manhattan was the only borough with the passing rate above 50 percent. In addition to the decrease in the number of adults passing the task exam, the city is also experiencing a decline in individuals taking the exams. The city, which represents more than 50 percent of all task, text, task test takers in the state, saw a decrease of 43 percent in test completion from 2010 to 2015. In New York City, adult literacy and education programs are provided by the Department of Education's Adult Office of Adult and Continuing Education, OACE, as well as by CUNY, public libraries and nonprofits funded through the Department of Youth and Community Development, or DYCD. According to the DOE's website, OACE is the largest provider of adult literacy education services in the state and offers more than 900 day and evening classes at more than 175 sites in all five boroughs. Despite being the largest program in 2015, only 316 OACE students took the task exam and 299 passed it. In comparison, other New York City HSE programs operated by nonprofits, libraries, and CUNY had 4,900 students pass the task that year. We hope to learn more today about the reasons for the steep decline in the number of OACE students taking and passing the task exam. Some faculty members cite problems with the administration of OACE, claiming that administrators lack experience in adult education and thus do not provide appropriate support, curriculum, and books for adult learners. Teachers who have sent anonymous complaint letters to DOE officials have also complained of low morale, with veteran teachers being disrespected and pushed out. These teachers also report that they have been pushed to test students excessively before they've had time to make progress, which takes away from instructional time. I was contacted by some of these teachers and met with them along with the committee staff and heard firsthand some of their concerns. We have received written testimony from adult education teachers, some of it submitted anonymously, and we'll also be hearing from some retired OACE teachers today. Today's hearing will provide an opportunity for the DOE to respond to the concerns raised, as well as for educators, advocates, unions, adult learners, and other stakeholders to share their concerns and recommendations related to adult education and literacy with the committee. As I stated earlier, we will also hear testimony on Intro 1195 today. Uh, intro 1195 would require the Mayor's Office of Operations to submit to the Council an annual report by June 1st of each year with information on adult literacy programs offered by the city or pursuant to a contract with the city. The report would include the number of adult literacy programs offered, the number of people who applied to such programs, the scoring method of any literacy intake examination used to screen applicants, the number of applicants who were denied admission to programs based on the results of an examination, and the number of applicants who were denied admission to programs due to an adult literacy program's capacity limitations. I would like to remind everyone who wishes to testify today that you must fill out a witness slip which is located on the desk of the Sergeant at Arms near the front of this room. If you wish to testify on 1195, please indicate on the witness slip whether you are here to testify in favor or in opposition to the bill. I also want to point out that we will not be voting on Intro 1195 today. To allow as many people as possible to testify, testimony will be limited to three minutes per person. And uh, please note that all witnesses will be sworn in before giving testimony. And I'd also like to ask the administration to please stay to hear some of the teachers 
uh, complaints so that uh, they can uh, be um, taken very seriously by the department. So we hope that you'll be able to stay for part of that testimony. Now, uh, Councilmember Menchaca's statement. Obtaining a quality education is a basic right of every New Yorker and the cornerstone to an equitable and just society. I thank Council Member and Chair of the Committee for Education, Daniel Drum, and I thank everyone present to provide, to, to provide testimony. Education is a lifelong process for all age groups. It is critical in the successful development of individuals and for society. Mahatma Gandhi once said, adult education can be said as education for life, through life and throughout the life. Adult literacy in particular is an essential tool for individuals eager to advance in one of the most competitive job markets in the world. A higher proportion of adults with low literacy proficiency hinges job readiness and weakens our local economy. Many job opportunities remain vacant for lack of prospective personnel who are not adequately trained. Additionally, the inability of individuals to understand societal and city issues reduces community involvement and civic participation. Intro 1195 requires the mayor's office to issue an annual report to the speaker on adult literacy programs offered by the city. This bill will provide data to better assess the demand for adult literacy programs and their programmatic effectiveness. It helps us prioritize agency and council resources to further eliminate disparities in under-resourced communities. I look forward to reviewing all of the testimony and feedback on Intro 1195 Thank you, and that is the statement of Council Member Menchaca, who is the sponsor of that legislation. And uh, before I swear in the administration, I'd like to say that we have been joined by Council Member Mark Traeger from Brooklyn, Council Member Antonio Reynoso from Brooklyn and Queens, Council Member Chaim Deutsch from Brooklyn, Council Member... All Bro Brooklyn is in the house. <laughs> Council Member, yes, no, let's go like this. Where's, Council the, rest of, where's the rest of the uh, they're coming, they're coming. Council Member Vincent Gentili from Brooklyn as well, Council Member Alan Maisel from Brooklyn, and I'm sure that other members of the committee will be joining us shortly. Uh, I myself also have been back and forth between both rooms because I have, test I have um, legislation that is being, two pieces of legislation that's being heard in the Aging Committee. So at some point, Margaret Chin, who's the chair of the Aging Committee, may come in and take over while I go over there to, to hear that. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member. Uh, Traeger. Now to the administration. We have been joined by Laura Fehu, who is the Senior Supervising Superintendent for the New York City Department of Education. We have Rong Zhang uh, with DYCD. Uh, we have Stacy Evans, I believe, Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. And is Vernon Kelman here from the New York City Department of Education? So are you going to give testimony now as well? Oh, he's, for Q, he's here for Q&A. Okay. All right. So um, if we need you, then we will swear you in at that time. May I ask those who are on the panel now to raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay. Ms. Fehu, are you going to start? Okay. Good morning, Chairman Drum and members of the Committee on Education. I'm Stacey Evans, Literacy Advisor in WorkDev, the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development. My job is to coordinate and support the integration of adult education in New York City's workforce system and to support the strengthening and expansion of adult education services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the City's approach to adult education. As a former adult literacy instructor and program director with 25 years in the field, I thank the Council for its ongoing focus on adult literacy. WorkDev is tasked to work with agency partners, employers, labor, education and training providers, philanthropy and community stakeholders to reshape the city's workforce system into one that more effectively meets the education, training and employment needs of city residents and employers. WorkDev's goals are to build skills employers seek, improve job quality and increase system and policy coordination. A strong adult education system is critical to both the skill building and coordination goals. And the goal of creating a more coordinated system is critical to the delivery of a strong adult education service that meets the varied needs of adult learners and job seekers. The adult literacy landscape in New York City 
includes programs and services offered through the Department of Education, the City University of New York, the three public library systems, and the many community-based programs that contract with the Department of Youth and Community Development. Funding to support these programs comes from city, state, and federal funding streams, as well as private foundations. We gratefully acknowledge the Council's long history of supporting adult education, particularly the allocation of $6 million for adult education programming in the FY17 budget, matching the city's level of support. That funding enabled the system to serve more learners and to extend its reach to parents and community schools. We appreciate Council's renewed matching allocation in FY18 and look forward to continuing our partnership with Council to support adult education. Adult literacy services offered include English for Speakers of Other Languages, ESOL, Young Adult Literacy and Adult Basic Education, ABE. These are classes providing basic skills instruction for youth and adults with reading and math levels below the ninth grade. And High School Equivalency, or HSE classes, for youth and adults with 10th to 12th grade reading and math levels, which prepare students to earn their HSE diploma. Adult literacy plays an important role in the city's workforce system vision. Research of middle skill jobs in key industry sectors show that nearly 90% of those jobs require a high school diploma. However, a large share of customers served by city workforce development programs lack basic literacy, numeracy, and or English proficiency skills. Therefore, many of these New Yorkers do not qualify for the vast majority of jobs. Adult literacy programming, then, is the first step of the Career Pathways framework for these New Yorkers, providing access to the training and credentials needed to obtain good jobs. At present, the city serves roughly 70,000 adults or older youth in its adult education programs. Adult literacy programs are a critical support, helping prepare New Yorkers for high, higher wage jobs by providing education programs to job seekers with limited levels of educational attainment, building necessary foundation skills for youth and adults who are not yet ready for college, training, or career check jobs. Turning to the proposed intro 1195, we very much support the goals of the bill and we will work with the council to align the text with the data we can capture. Our career pathways and common metrics databases will facilitate the compilation of the system-wide data needed. In closing, thank you again for the chance to testify today. WorkDub looks forward to working with the council on our shared goal of supporting adult education to help New Yorkers develop their skills. Once my colleagues finish their testimony, I'm happy to answer any questions. Ms. Evans, do you have written testimony to submit? We don't have it yes, here. I do have it. Okay, very good. Sergeant, can I ask you to get that for us, please? Okay, who's going to go next? Okay, Ms. Fahu. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Drum and members of the City Council Committee on Education. My name is Dr. Laura Fahu, and I am the Senior Supervising Superintendent at the New York City Department of Education. I am joined here by Vernon Kelman, Director of Data and Accountability at the DOE's Office of Adult and Continuing Education, OACE. We are pleased to be here today to discuss our work to provide high quality adult education programming to city residents and intro number 1195. I thank the City Council for your work to support, support adult education and I thank the Council's Education Committee for this opportunity. OAC's mission is to empower adults in their roles as parents, family members, workers, and community members through a continuum of services. Last year, we offered 700 tuition-free classes to over 50,000 adults, 21 and older, at two, over 200 sites in all five boroughs. The majority of OAC programs are funded by a prescriptive New York State Employment Preparation Education, EPE, EPI grant from the New York State Education Department. This grant provides approximately 30 million in annual funding. By law, the majority of EPI dollars must be used to serve students 21 years old or older who do not hold a U.S. high school credential. Students 21 years or older who have a high school diploma from another country may also be served by EPI funded programs. Federal funding for OACE includes a five-year Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, WIOA grants, and a 440,000 Vocational and Technical Education Act annual award. We also received $9 million in city funding this year to support adult education services. That's from the city. We are particularly proud of the diverse student population served by OACE's programming. Last year, we served students representing more than 182 countries. The average age of an OACE student is 39 years old. 60% of our students are women, and 80% are low income. 
To meet the varying needs of our students, OACE offers classes weekdays in the morning, afternoon, and evenings, and on Saturdays. These options are available on a year-round basis. Adult learners can participate in classes at any of our sites, regardless of their bor borough of residence. Student admissions to most of our programs is rolling, and program applicants participate in a registration process that includes an overview session, intake interview, assessment, and orientation. Prospective students can register by visiting any of our adult learning centers. The majority of the students we serve seek English for speakers of other languages, ESOL support, and most enter our program performing at the lowest English proficiency levels. While ESOL instruction teaches students basic language skills and the academic skills they will need to successfully complete higher education or job training, adult basic education and adult secondary education classes prepare students for the high school equivalency test. Each year, roughly 1% of OACE students enter at or above the ninth grade math and reading level required to access the high school equivalency curriculum. OACE has a career and technical education program serving over 3,000 students at seven sites across the city. Our CTE program has a workforce development focus. Many students complete our classes and gain industry knowledge and state certifications allowing them to pursue meaningful employment and or post-secondary education. Our CTE co course offerings range from basic computer literacy to certified nursing assistant, automotive and construction programs. All OACE classes are taught by certified teachers and use high quality standards aligned curriculum. OACE teachers receive ongoing high quality professional development through a collaboration with the New York City Regional Adult Education Network, RAIN. The RAIN is an NY uh, NYSID contracted entity funded to provide professional development training and other support to all federal, state-funded adult literacy programs in the city. In addition, since 2014, we invested in additional intensive professional development for 400 ABE and ASE teachers and hired additional math teachers to work with students and teachers. Over the past five years, OACE has seen a steady increase in student performance. The percentage of our students showing one or more years growth per the federal national reporting standards increased from 50% in 2012 to 71% in 2017. The number of OACE students receiving their high school equivalency HSE since New York State introduced the Test Assessing Secondary Completion task in 2014 has declined as it has across the state. In fiscal year 2014, the last year of the previous assessment, 565 OACE students took the high school equivalency exam. This number has decreased to 316 test takers in fiscal year 2015, the first full year of testing under the new assessment. However, the pass rate improved in fiscal year 2015 with 95% of OACE test takers earning an HSE diploma as compared to 89% in fiscal year 2014. To ensure that the services of OACE are widely known, OACE hired eight full-time community liaisons last year. Their primary responsibility is to engage with community leaders, elected officials, and other city agencies to attend events throughout the city advertising class availability. Additional flyers advertising classes availability are distributed five times per year with supermarket circulars across the city, and the DOE placed paid ads in subways, ethnic and community print outlets, and online promoting adult education program locations throughout the city. We also maintain literacy, literacy zone drop-in centers at OACE Learning Centers in Manhattan, the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn that connect students to OACE's classes and other city resources to assist them with housing, legal, medical, employment, and other needs. OACE has established numerous collaborations with community and faith-based organizations. Within the DOE itself, OACE partners with other divisions. Family engagement and collaboration are top priorities for OACE, as 44% of OACE students are parents, with a total of approximately 15,000 children in city public schools. OACE works regularly with the DOE's Division of Family and Community Engagement, FACE, and participates in many of the family engagement activities held across the city. 
For example, OACE staff presented and distributed materials to parent coordinators during their quarterly conference and professional development workshops. Additionally, OACE staff participated in the citywide native language family engagement conferences. With support from the City Council, OACE is also a part of the Community Schools Initiative, one of the key educational initiatives of this administration. The collaboration has enabled community schools and community-based organizations and OACE to work in tandem to deliver free, accessible, high-quality adult education services in 22 community schools across the city, serving over 400 adults. I want to thank the City Council for this funding initiative. This year, we are expanding the initiative to additional schools. At this time, I'd like to briefly address the proposed legislation. Intro number 1195 requires the Mayor's Office of Operations to report on adult literacy programs offered by the city or pursuant to a contract with the city. We support the goal of this legislation to ensure transparency. However, we would welcome the opportunity to meet with City Council after the hearing to ensure that the reporting parameters the Council establishes align to existing reporting systems and those of NYSED's funding program database, so we have one streamlined set of reports and data systems as opposed to overlapping duplicative systems. We are committed to ensuring that New York City residents have access to high quality education. We know we have more work to do and look forward to our continued partnership with City Council. Thank you. Next please. Good morning, Chairman Drum and members of the Committee on Education. My name is Wang Zhen. I'm the Senior Director for Adult Education at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD. Thank you for the chance to testify today and for the City Council's strong support of adult literacy programs over the years. For over 30 years, DYCD has been administering adult literacy programs through community-based organizations across New York City. DYCD funds and supports a broad network of CBOs to ensure our city's diverse communities have access to a range of reading, writing, English language, and high school equivalency programs. With services and locations in local neighborhoods, CBOs have strong roots in local communities and have established trust with community members. Adult students and older youth who struggle to succeed in traditional school settings are attracted to academic programs in their communities. By attending neighborhood-based adult literacy classes, they take the critical next steps toward raising their literacy levels and completing their education while becoming better positioned for employment and economic opportunities. CBO-based literacy programs also offer the benefit of being located in multi-service organizations with cultural and linguistic competence, enabling them to provide services and supports in a holistic manner under one roof. This is especially attractive for immigrant New Yorkers. <clears throat> in fiscal year 2017, 90 DYCD-funded adult literacy programs served over 14,000 New Yorkers. Instructional services were offered to students at least 16 years of age and not enrolled or required to be enrolled in secondary school under state law. Students who lacked sufficient mastery of basic educational skills, lacked a high school diploma, or who were unable to speak, read, or write the English language to participate in education, training, or employment. Programs assist adults to become literate and obtain the knowledge and skills necessary for employment and self-sufficiency and to pursue further education. Adult basic education, ABE, and high school equivalency, HSE programs provide instruction in reading, writing, and mathematics and prepare students for the HSE tests. English for speakers of other languages, ESL, programs provide instruction to increase basic English language communication skills. All programs provide classes that meet a minimum of six hours a week. Classes offer flexible, flexible hours and are available in the morning, afternoon, and evening to meet the needs of participants. We thank the City Council for working with the Mayor to add $12 million in adult literacy funding in fiscal year 2017. With the portion that DYCD received, 
we expanded adult literacy program slots and strengthened program capacity and quality so that students can achieve better learning outcomes. Literacy Assistance Center, our literacy technical assistance provider, offered increased professional development trainings for DYCD's community-based literacy providers. Due to the strong support of Council Member Menchaka and the City Council, the adopted fiscal year 2018 budget included again a one-year allocation of $12 million for adult literacy programs. Given the tremendous demand and need for adult literacy programs in New York City, it is vital to maximize existing resources. Towards this end, we work with DOE and HRA to increase access to existing adult literacy programs. For example, we have worked to connect DYCD's, I'm sorry, we have worked to connect DOE's adult literacy programs to DYCD's Beacon and Cornerstone programs. DOE's programs provide teachers, while DYCD's Beacon and Cornerstone community centers offer space to house classes. DYCD and HRA staff provided joint orientation sessions to adult literacy providers on HRA's employment services programs and their clients. Our program locations and capacity are shared with HRA programs to facilitate referral collaboration and coordination of services. To conclude my testimony today, I'd like to brief, briefly address intro 1195. While DYCD is in the process of upgrading its program databases, we are prepared to work with the Mayor's Office of Operations, Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, or, or another designee of the Mayor to provide the info for this annual adult education report. Um, however, we uh, suggest that the release of the date of the annual report is pushed back from June 1 to allow for a full fiscal year to be prepared, to be reported on. We welcome the opportunity to meet with the City Council after today's hearing to further discuss this bill. Thank you again for the chance to testify today. We look forward to our continued partnership with the City Council to support adult literacy programs. I'm ready to answer any questions you, might, you may have. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony to this panel. Uh, let me start first by asking Mr. Zhang. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that in fiscal 2017, 90 DYCD funded adult literacy programs served over 14,000 New Yorkers. Of that 14,000, can you tell us how many were prepared to take tests or what did that program breakdown look like? Uh, what are they being prepared for? I think, I think your mic is off, yeah. We served, FY17, we served over 14,000 people, and uh, the breakdown would be, let's see, all right, the bulk of the students are in our ESOL programs, that's about, that's over 8,000 people enrolled in the ESL programs. ABE programs, uh, a little over 2,000. HSE, we have about 14, Hundred. Uh, that's the breakdown of the enrollment. And uh, specifically, I think you asked about the how many people actually uh, took the test. We, uh, out of the fourteen hundred people, we referred about seven hundred and fifty people to take the high school equivalency test, and out of that, three hundred and eighty-nine people obtained a high school diploma certification. That's uh, about 52%. And that was in fiscal 2017? Yes. So that seems to me, because according to the New York Post story of 2015, that 4,900 students passed the task. It seems to have dropped somewhat. If it's 750 in 2017 that passed. Um, we'll need, have to need to take a look at previous year's data. Um, not aware that we had 4,000 people. 900. Can you get back to us on that? Because that's really an important distinction. And um, I'm wondering if that was the year that the test changed. Um, would you know that offhand? Well, the year yes. the new test uh, took place, I think it was two, beginning of 2015. 2015. Yeah. 
Okay, so. Can I just clarify that the 4,900 is for DYCD, for the libraries, and for CUNY, not just for DYCD? Okay. Okay, that's good. All right, thank you. So let me go on to DOE. Um, how many teachers are currently teaching under OACE? While you're looking for that, let me just also say we've been joined by Councilmember Debbie Rose and Councilmember Rafael Salamanca. And Councilmember Dan Garodnik. Yeah, I'll have to get back to you on the number. I may have it in here, but I'm not sure that I did. Okay, uh, can you put your mic on? Okay. I apologize. I'm not readily able to find the number of teachers uh, in the. Vernon's going to answer the question for me. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do have to sway you in before you answer. Okay, let me just find the relevant numbers on the back. Um. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to, or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Okay, thank you. And then state your name for the record, please. My name is Vernon Kelman. Okay, thank you. And that number? Can you repeat the question, please? The number of teachers. Yeah, is your mic on? The red light should be on. I just put it on, sorry. Okay, good. Could you repeat the question? The question is, um, how many teachers are currently teaching under OACE? We have a total of 147 full-time teachers and 379 per session teachers. Now, can you give us an, um, a number of, for the teacher turnover rate for the past 10 years? Would you be able to give us that type of information? No, I would not. How about for the last year? We could send you teacher turnover data. I just want to clarify the difference between a full-time teacher, we could give you turnover data for per session is an application process every year, and so we might have a different range of people that apply for the program, but we could provide you. But the program, has, has it been renamed? No, it's all. So basically, you'd still have a core group of people who would be applying for those jobs and who would be receiving those jobs under the UFT contract, am I right? Absolutely, the 147 remains fairly consistent, but we will get you the turnover data on the full-time employees. I'm just making a distinction between the 379 per session mm -hmm. teachers, which we probably can also tell you how many have retention rights under the contract mm -hmm. and who return and not, but I, there's a distinction between those that are. Yeah, sometimes they don't reapply for it, but basically mostly many teachers do reapply for that, so. Yes. If we could get those numbers, I would really appreciate that. We want to look at that very carefully. And, and, and in terms of those numbers as well, those who retired, resigned, or who were terminated would be important to us. Sure. Okay, what is the total number of staff working under OACE? 729. 729? And what about administrators? 23. 103? 23. 23. Okay, and can you give us the turnover rate for that as well? We'll get that to you. Okay. Um, we have, a, I, as I mentioned in my opening testimony, a number of advocates and teachers who have raised concerns about the administration of the adult education literacy programs. Does the DOE track uh, filed complaints against administrators? A absolutely. Any complaints we receive are either, depending on the nature of those complaints, um, are either reviewed by the Special Commissioner of Investigation, referred to the Office of Special Investigation, or referred as a school-based investigation, some of which we engage in and some of which, uh, depending on the nature of the case, who would review those. Do you know the number there? Uh, I would, there would be no way for me to know the Special Commissioner of Investigation because those are confidential cases. They're only when they referred, but I would have to ask the Office of Special Investigations how many had been referred to uh, that office. Okay, though, and, and so if it went to the office, the Special Commissioner's Office for Investigation, or OSI, that would be for more serious type complaints. 
uh, ones that we received that we would escalate to SCI would be more serious complaints, and oftentimes they make the determination whether to hold the case or refer it to OSI, but we have no knowledge of how many would be in their database since they're a city agency. Uh, not would there. harassment um, go to OSI? Harassment, it would depend. Uh, typically, if it had to do with OEO complaints, Office of Equal Opportunity, they are very confidential. We would not get numbers on those. That office holds those confidential in the highest regard, and so uh, they would handle any complaints like that. Those can either come through the same referral system, SCI to OEO, or some go directly to OEO. The other, uh, the, another complaint that I've heard is um, the use the materials being used in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Some of the teachers that I met with complained that the materials were mostly for children rather than for adults. Yeah. What materials are you using uh, for adult uh, education classes? So, without naming each subject area material, I want to raise your attention as I did when I met with you and the committee of teachers you brought together to meet with us to talk about this, there are a couple of different things. When the test changed, we had to obviously select curriculum that aligned with the HSE test um, so that we would be preparing students in that continuum. But in order to select those materials, we used committees of teachers and committees of principals, and we had a curriculum fair, much like the rest of the department does, to have the people doing the work look at those materials in order to make the decision about which were the best ones for either the ESOL classes or certainly the HSE classes at each level. But there was a curriculum committee that made those decisions. If you're looking for specific titles, I would have to send to you for each of the content areas and for each of the subjects what titles we're using. I don't know if that was the intent, but all no, the no, classes I, have How been. was that committee formed? Um, believed by the chapter, the union chapter, as well as the principals coming together to, um, to do this. Do um, adult ed teachers receive a survey similar to the survey that teachers in uh, regular Department of Ed classes receive, the annual survey? That is a good question. I'm not sure that they do. They do? I'm not sure. Do they receive the um, satisfaction survey? We're going to check. I'm sorry. I don't have the answer. Okay. Uh, that's really also very important. And uh, if they don't, let me state on the record, I would certainly hope that in the future they will. I will I think that that um, survey uh, was very helpful to me as a teacher uh, in terms of learning about the, um, the atmosphere in school environments um, as well as issues of trust with administrators as well. Um, so in 2014, this, I have the answer here. Okay, in 2014, the state transitioned from administering the GED uh, exam to administering the task. Um, what efforts were taken by the DOE to support educators with this transition? Well, we provide professional development to teachers, especially in those areas, as the test was transitioning. I mean, we knew well in advance that the state did not continue to adopt the GED test. And so we did provide professional development to all of the teachers in both the transitioning curriculum materials as well as the changes in the test. The format of the test as well as the sections of the test, as you know, have changed. And so that was provided to teachers over the course of the school year. How is the professional development delivered? When is it done? Um, how are teachers given the, 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 the training that they need? So I would say, that, so if I could take one step back, we have eight principals responsible for the regional centers, and the principals are responsible for figuring that out um, and providing professional development. We also use the RAIN network to be able to provide professional development that's uh, funded by the state so that there's aligned professional development for teachers. But I want to make the distinction that the principals are responsible for figuring out the plan because there are a lot of challenges. There is a lot of procession teachers that you heard us just report out on, as well as full-time teachers. And to be able to make sure that people could get to opportunities both at their site or to travel to a site provides a challenge. So principals have plans of professional development to be able to do that. And we had to do that as we transitioned the test to make sure that our procession providers are equally adept at providing instruction over smaller chunks of time as our full-time providers have during the regular day. So I would say both push in and pull out opportunities for that professional development. 
Um, just to get the, um, the, the, the order of, um, uh, of supervision in, sure. in the department. It's you who then oversees Superintendent Mills? I oversee all of the superintendents in the Department of Education, all 46. All, all so of Superintendent them. Mills is one of the superintendents and programs that I oversee. I would set aside that I've been involved with uh, adults at a little longer um, in terms of Tim Lasante in District 79 and adult education, both when it was Jan Coles and Rosemary Mills, over a period of years. So, but for, for adult education, it would be Superintendent Mills, right? Yes. For okay, and then Superintendent Mills oversees the principals, did you say seven? Yes. Uh, eight. Eight. Eight principals. Yes. And then those principals are responsible to get the um, professional development out to the teachers. Yes, and they also receive professional development. So I want to share that it's a coordinated effort in terms of what professional development we give principals to then figure out the best ways to do that with teachers in the regions. Um, so it's not each person does their own thing. There's certainly a coordinated effort. I don't want to make it sound like that. But how they figure out specifically where people are going at what times. Okay, so let's go back to the New York Post uh, again. I can't believe I'm quoting the New York Post so often. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, this is where we got some of our data. Uh, in 2015, OACE served more than 27,000 adult students, but only 316 passed. And I noticed that in your testimony, you did say that, um, let me just go back to it that the rate was improving. Yes. Um, so, um, but still, it seems to me that there are few test takers compared to the overall number of students who are enrolled in the program. Right. Can you describe for me the reason why there are still so few test takers? Sure, much like our other agencies uh, reported, most of our students that come through the program are very interested in ESOL programs. We serve whatever students come to us and we create classes based on the student need. And that is by far probably two thirds of our student enrollment is for ESOL classes. And then the next largest chunk, I would say uh, probably a, another portion of that third that's left are for adults basic education. We take students in at very low levels of education in order to progress them in the direction of the high school equivalency exam. So as they progress through the classes and through the levels, there is about 1%, which is about the average students that are ready to access the curriculum for HSE. The curriculum is written at a ninth grade level, as you would imagine, because it's a high school equivalency exam. So in order for them to access the curriculum materials, we have to prepare them for that. And so the preponderance of the people are coming in at other levels. So it's a very small number in those classes. The numbers and the percentage that we represented in terms of passing the exam, we do very well with students who get to that level, stay with us, or come in at that level, and then take the test after taking our program. Okay, so um, what criteria do students need to achieve in order to be eligible to take the task exam? Um, so in order to, there's a ninth grade level. We have to test them and they have to test in at the ninth grade level to be able to assess the curriculum. Once they do that, we put them in classes at the adult secondary education level and we prepare them for the test. The decision of when in that range they take the test is a conversation between the student and what their goals are. Because I will add that the goals of the student play a big role in how we make decisions about where they choose to take classes and what classes they choose to take. So it's a decision that's made by the student, but certainly uh, the student would consult with the teacher about what readiness to take the exam. So uh, one of the complaints that I've received uh, deals with the, um, the, the number of tests that uh, teachers have to uh, give mm -hmm. during the course of their time in the classroom. Sure. And a number of them complained to me that um, it's difficult to give the test I think they have to be given individually, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, they have a whole bunch of other students sitting in the class that are not being serviced. Can you describe how those tests, what those tests look like that the teachers are required to give? Um, I think it's monthly, if I'm not mistaken. No, so there's one required, so we have to pretest them as a requirement of the state. And then there's one requirement on the first post test that we have to give depending on the number of hours the student is in class, the first post-test is required by the state. 
After that, it is up to the student and the teacher to make decisions around that. I don't know, uh, Vernon, if you want to describe the firm format of the test, but as with all classes, you can imagine that there are things students can do as a part of the test or as the class independently at the same time. I mean, we expect that we have a differentiated group of people. We wouldn't want to test the whole class at the same time, who some of them may not be ready to take the test or it may be too soon. How long does it take for the teacher to give the test? How long is the test administered? We're talking ESL tests. Uh, the post, I think the post ready. Well, the, the test that you the, use to determine whether they're ready to move to the next level. For ESL students, it's a computer-based test, um, and the test is adaptive, so the time varies depending on the answer sequence um, the student gives. Um, so that's the, for ESL instruction. Um, for BE instruction, the test is a written test. Um, um, so at what point is a teacher involved in administering the test? The state guideline for the first post-test depends on the intensity of the class, how many, the weekly hours. But the average among all classes about, is about 40, 45 hours before the first post-test needs to be administered. Mm -hmm. So when the, what I was trying to get at is when does the teacher administer the test to individual students? How long or how often does that have to happen in a classroom? Like if I have 30 kids in my class and I have to give one test to each kid every day, that means every single day of the, you know, of the month or more, I'm having to sit with the kids and then there's no time for me to give you know, whole group instruction or directions or anything. That's what I'm looking for. Well, but while the teacher is monitoring the student taking the test, they can still be teaching. It's not that it would take the whole test period and the rest so of that, So what does, it, what does the test require the teacher to do? For ESL tests, the test will require the teacher to ask the student a series of questions. To ask the questions? To ask and then grade the answers based on. So that would seem to me that it would take a good deal of time to administer that test. And then the question that I have is how often are we doing that testing and how does that take teachers away from the work that they need to do with other students in the classroom? And that is one of the complaints that I'm getting from the teachers is that it takes an awful lot away from actually working with the other students in the classroom because of the frequency of the testing. So just the first one is required. After that, it's a, there's no requirement on the number of hours to take the test before the readiness. I think that that's a determination also of the teacher, of the student's readiness to go into the next level of classes or to get from ESOL into adult basic education. Uh, but we'll get back to you on the timing of the test. I do not believe it's a full amount of time, but we can get back to you on how many minutes it takes to ask the specific questions for that portion of the test. Okay, so let's just move on. What efforts has the DOE taken to institute, um, to increase the number of task, task takers? Um, you mentioned that you were successful in getting more test takers. What have you done? Uh, so as I provided in the testimony, we were closely with FACE. We went to the parent coordinators meeting, so we'd make sure every city school can refer adults to us. We put flyers in the newspapers and in supermarkets five times a year. There is a subway ad um, as well that goes out. Uh, we provide information at the places where we have adult education classes. And recently we hired one person in each region whose responsibility it is to make local partnerships, faith-based organizations, elected people that we can, our partners in the community, to be able to hold this information and share this information. Uh, we use regular city places like the libraries to provide information and there's some amount of referral in pro into programs from our other CD partners. I, I just want to thank you for that. I want to just take, go back a little bit to what I was asking before, as a matter of fact. Um, is the process the same for all the agencies in terms of how students are evaluated and tests are given and how the teachers um, 
you know, uh, give the test, distribute the test? Is the, do, do, do all the DYCD programs operate in the same way as the BOE programs? In terms of administering uh, best plus for ESL and a TAPE for AB is very similar. Uh, students come in, you give them ESL students, you give them pre-test using best plus. AB students, you give them pre-test using TAPE test. And then what DYCD does is that we require each class we establish will have about 120 instruction hours, and at which time you you give the post test. So it's it's around 100 instruction hours, then you'll give a test. Uh, it's and I would have to say that it's 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 really necessary and important to assess student progress after a period of instruction. <clears throat> Okay, you know, I'm gonna let some of my colleagues ask questions because they have questions as well. So uh, we have Councilmember Traeger, uh, followed by Rosenthal, and then Rose who have questions. Uh, uh, Councilmember Traeger. Thank you very much, Chair Drum, for this very important uh, oversight hearing. Um, I just wanna provide some brief context before I go into my question is that, uh, as many of you know, I, I represent a, an area that was devastated by Superstorm Sandy and we worked hard to uh, bring, uh, with, the, with the help of the administration, a Workforce One Center into Coney Island to help connect residents with recovery employment opportunities. Um, speaking with Workforce One staff, uh, we learned that a number of, of residents uh, from southern Brooklyn were walking into the office lacking a high school equivalency diploma, uh, which was an issue for many employers because that, that's a base, basic requirement. So uh, we partnered up with a, a great organization, uh, OBT, Opportunities for Better Tomorrow, which, which is a great organization, uh, to provide free, on-site, local uh, high school equivalency classes in the Coney Island community. So I've received some feedback and some uh, information after their, their first year, and I think it's important that I share that with you and get your feedback. Um, first of all, I, I think note, even noted in your testimony uh, that a number of uh, applicants, uh, students, are parents themselves. So daycare was an issue. Daycare is an issue, especially if the classes are uh, during hours where they have to care for their child, that became a barrier. I also heard that a, a number of the applicants, uh, I, I believe that in order to take the classes and take the tests, uh, now it's called TASC, uh, you need to have a certain reading level, certain uh, math level. Some folks are not there. So the nonprofit is suggesting that I work to get pre-high school equivalency classes even before we get to the classes. Um, so I, I do want to hear about what are we doing to make sure that we are uh, building up the capacity and the skills of, of the applicants um, also, there are some folks, I, I, I read in your testimony that I'm not sure if the state tailored it this way, that you have to be 21 and over to take the, the course, uh, or, or, and because some, someone might be 19 or 20, are we leaving them out? Uh, so I just want to get clarity on that. But I just want to hear your feedback and thoughts on some stuff that we're seeing already in, in my district. Okay. Um, so let me try to address the daycare issue first. So. A lot of our families are school-aged children, but many of them are in school, I would say the majority. There are definitely, uh, one of the challenges of adult education is for adults that have young children. We have pre-K centers, we're starting 3K, not in Coney Island, but certainly 3K to get more and more students able to do that. I'm happy to partner with a community organization and figure some of that out and be able to provide you with the locations of adult ed programs in Coney Island because I know we have a number of them. And so the challenge you're talking about is not being able to access the ninth grade curriculum, which is really what prepares you for the test, is one of our biggest challenges and an area that we're focused on because a good number of our students are in that category. And so to partner to get them ready to go into the program that you've created a partnership with is something we'd be happy to do because we are strong in our ABE programs and can provide you with locations that they can go to and then come back to this program if they prefer to take the HSE program 
here. So there is a number in Staten Island. I, I want to clarify the 21 and older uh, situation. So the way the Department of Education is funded, and it would be a different answer for DYCE or some of the other city agencies, is that up to 21, the year that you turn 21, you are the responsibility of the Department of Education, and that is funded through um, District 79 and Tim Lasante. This, I believe, was adult education hearing, how we refer to it in the DOE. That's above 21, no longer mandatory education required, and so we use majority state funding to be able to support adults 21 and older. But if you wanted to take a high school equivalency exam and you were under 21, we would just refer you to a District 79 program, try to encourage you, depending on the number of credits and how old you are, to complete your high school program. And we have transfer schools, and we have alternative schools. We have some transition centers where you don't have to decide right away. You can take classes in math and English and science and social studies so that we get you ready for either passing the regions or taking an exam. But we support students straight through um, 21, but particular to what my testimony was about was adult education and um, OACE above 21. Uh, okay, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that, and I would like to follow up uh, with, with the DOE uh, with regards to what we can provide to uh, build up capacity to prepare them to take the classes and, and meet them where they are. Uh, and one last thing, Chair, just be aware that one of the things that we also heard feedback on, which my office addressed through uh, grants is a lack of technology because a lot of a lot of these uh, courses and actually I think the exam I think it's it's tech based as well if I'm not mistaken um, and and so uh, w I use the digital uh, uh, literacy uh, initiative grants to provide uh, computers uh, for students in the program uh, but I just want to make sure that there's technology access for all sites, making sure that they have functioning working computers and someone's there to help them with those basic skills as well, that this should be not just preparing them for a test, but preparing them for life skills in general. Um, I will say that while it was um, intended that this test would be fully online test-based, it is still not yet there. Uh, we still do plenty of paper and pencil. And while I'd like to say that OACE has a very strong initiative focusing on technology and building the technology structure not only to one day maybe support the test, but to support instruction in CTE classes like medical billing and some of the other coursework students are taking when it's appropriate for that class, we have a growing technology, I won't say in every single classroom or every single student having it, but we do have a growing program of technology where we're focused on it and we know that it's an imperative skill for today's employment. And just to add to that, um, building up technology is really an ongoing effort and I'm glad to report that last year, fiscal 17, with the additional funds for dollar receipt, we actually, DYCD, centrally purchased 20 laptops for each of our funded literacy programs. And, uh, and also our TA provider provided a series of digital literacy and integrating technology into instruction uh, trainings. So it has been very, very uh, uh, useful and beneficial to the students, to, especially for those who need to take the computer-based test. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you for sponsoring this committee hearing. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm the chair of the Contracts Committee, and one of the things that I've been looking at over the last three years is how adequately we fund our contracts and whether or not they um, are sufficiently funded to do the work that we're asking them to do. And um, the administration really made a, a terrific move in this last budget by increasing funding for contract services in several areas. Adult literacy was not one of them. And uh, I've heard from providers that the contracts are severely underfunded compared to the work that uh, these organizations are being asked to do. So, um, Mr. Zhang, actually, if I could start with you, how many contracts, just some basic information, 
how many contracts does DYCD have for adult literacy, and what's the reimbursement rate? Um, we, across the program areas, um, we have 90 programs, I said earlier, that's pretty much the 90 contracts. 90 contracts? Yes. Okay. Uh, last year. And, uh, Is each contract for a single provider at a single site? Uh, not necessarily. Some providers have mu multiple contracts. Okay. For example, they may have an ABE and an ESL. Okay. So um, they may have two. And we have, as I said, we have different program areas. For example, we have ESL programs. We also have EL civics programs. Mm -hmm. So a little bit different. Um, so one agency might have both of these. And reimbursement, we, at DYCD, from our last RFP, we basically uh, settled on a per student cost of $850 to $950. That's a range that uh, our, we have been using. And when was that RFP issued? The last RFP was issued for 2015. When do you plan on issuing the next one, and will you do a uh, review of sort of a, a model, you know, uh, actual, you know, cost-based model in order to come up with the reimbursement rate? Well, that's, you know, that's always the case. You know, whenever we have a new RFP, we, will, we review the, the cost, too. Um, that's what we did last time. Mm -hmm. So when are you going to have a new RFP? Um, we recently renewed the current contracts. So it's like a three-year yes, and three then a three-year renewal. renewal. So there will be probably another, I would say, year and a half so to begin to look at another RFP. May I continue for just a moment, Chair? Yes. Um, so you already, you, so in the renewal, you didn't, I'm going to guess you did not take the opportunity to update the rate structure. That's true. We didn't. We, we, well, this was, it has been an ongoing conversation with this, but um, at the renewal, we, we did not make any changes to the contract. Would you um, consider starting to go through that exercise? Here's why I say it. You know, for three years, I, I've been hearing about organizations that are really living, you know, on the edge, um, you know, um, and being held together by spit and glue. So specifically on adult literacy, I'm told that the actual rate that they do, because often these programs are mission-based providers, so they don't want to underserve. It's part of their mission. Um, so at the risk of the organization going down, they're providing services really at $1,500 per student. Um, We're certainly open to reviewing the, uh, the cost the next time when we have an opportunity. And I would have to say that um, um, with the additional funds, you know, th you know thanks to council, we tried to help agencies. For example, we bought each agency computers. We yeah, bought I, um, assessment I, materials for right. them. It's yeah. not the city council's responsibility. I mean, I'm grateful to my colleagues, and of course, that's terrific. Um, but uh, why? What's the downside? I've been working with the mayor's office of contracts on this uh, model-based budgeting and they're starting to do this now for other agencies where they're having a very interactive dialogue with providers about the services that they're providing and modalities, of course, get updated all the time. Um, why is there anything in law that prevents you from doing a model-based budgeting now of these um, contracts? and uh, modifying the contracts for real cost because we're talking about people learning today. I don't understand why we would wait for, you know, sort of this, uh, the, you know, uh, sort of false, if I can be so blunt, um, narrative of the contract doesn't get renegotiated for three more years. Contracts can get renegotiated every year. so. Um, at any time, 
the administration wants, right? I mean, I can give you three examples of it. So let's just assume it's true. Would you be willing to go back and start the model-based budgeting today? Well, points well taken. I'll take it back, and it's a discussion with you know our echo with our legal and our fiscal. And uh, when Council they Member, get funded, we have to wrap it up a little bit. Sorry, last question. Oh. When they get funded, is it 100% city funds, or do you get state and federal red, uh, reimbursement? Our contracts have mixed funding sources yes. with CTL, uh, federal CSBG, and federal CDBG. So uh, t if you could send back information to the committee on what percentage is city and the other, and then do city funds draw down additional other funds, right? So if you invest more city tax levy, does that bring in more federal or state funds? And we don't have that. You don't have that. Okay, thank you very much. So just the percentage. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Rose. Thank you. Um, the Office of Adult and Continuing Ed is the largest provider of adult literacy services in the state, and you offer more than 900 day and evening classes Monday through Saturday at more than 175 sites um, throughout the five boroughs. And every individual has to apply, um, has to partake in an int intake interview, right? So of the eight regional offices that you operate in New York City, there is not one in Staten Island. And um, if every individual is supposed to um, go through this intake process, that means that everyone on Staten Island has to travel somewhere, which is Region 8. Could you please um, tell me why that is, that there's no regional office in Staten Island, um, what the numbers are of people who participate in our adult ed um, programs, and how the distribution of staff or resources um, in District 8, um, Region 8, um, are distributed and how it impacts my, my um, not only my district, but Staten Island as a whole. Sure. So I'm going to make a few comments, and then I'm going to ask, in the meantime, uh, Vernon to look up the information about um, the number of programs or that we have in Staten Island. First, the Staten Island students would not have to go to a regional office. It is mostly aggregated so that we have eight schools, one of which covers part of Brooklyn and Staten Island. And so students can go to the regional walk-in center, but they can also go to other offices, and we can provide you with a list of those offices. So they would not have to go to Brooklyn for orientation or intake or for classes to get started or to be tested. There are plenty of places. I mean, I can name off the top of my head that we have one at New Dorp and um, uh, something in St. George, George, some places that we, they can go to and we can provide you with a list of those places for them to be able to access the intake. In the so no one has to go off of Staten Island to access um, the interview, the intake process? That is correct. And when, um, and so they can go to some other borough-based program? They can go and to programs it meets on the requirement. Sta yes, they can go to programs on Staten Island. We have those programs. The region encompasses part of Brooklyn, but that does not mean that we don't have the programs or the availability of all the services on Staten Island. I think that one thing I'd like to say to you is we certainly would like to grow our Staten Island program. I know that there is an opportunity now with the community schools partnerships to grow some of our Staten Island programs and increase them. Because what are our numbers? Because I'm sure that our numbers indicate that we should have a, a regional um, office in Staten Island. Uh, so the hubs that they're talking about are where the, uh, the facility is almost entirely adult education. I won't say entirely because it's also shared space, but there is a large hub of classes that happen at the Brooklyn Adult Learning Center or the Manhattan Adult Learning Center. And we could possibly, we could look into it and happy to have a dialogue further. We can provide you with information on where the principal is and where some of the courses are and where students can go for both registration and intake. Um, but a facility hub that requires a lot of space to be able to run one is something we don't have on Staten Island. So it's a further conversation. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, thank you very much. We do have a lot more questions, but uh, we're going to ask a lot of them by um, letter. Uh, but just to um, wrap it up with a couple of more. Uh, we've heard reports that there's been a reduction in the number of classes offered by OACE, as well as the elimination of some programs such as practical nursing, automotive, and distance learning programs. Why have these specific programs been closed, and has there been an overall reduction in the number of classes offered? Um, I don't believe there's a reduction in the number of classes offered, but Vernon's going to look into that. The Practical Nurses Program was both privately funded in partnership with um, an organization. And at one point in the past, we were utilizing state funding incorrectly to be able to provide this program. Once it went to fully privately funded, we were no longer able to fund it because uh, a requirement of a nurse is to have a high school diploma and one of the requirements of receiving EPI funds is not to have one. So it was in contradiction. So we moved towards privately funded and then that funding stream dried up with the um, closing of the hospital on Randall's Island. So that's one. Um, the distance learning, I'm not sure that we closed nor the, what's the third one you mentioned? Uh, automotive. No, the automotive program, we definitely have an automotive program, I'm certain of that. And distance learning? It, has, it hasn't been reduced? Uh, no, I believe there are students enrolled in the automotive program. Yes, we have. I think the, what happens with, 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 with uh, programs like this, um, like automotive, is if we lose a teacher, sometimes it's very difficult to replace that teacher because of the state requirement of having the proper certification. So there are certain areas um, like medical billing um, and, and let's say heating in you know, HVAC, you lose a teacher, um, it's very difficult to, to, to get a, a, a certified replacement. So that contributes to sometimes scaling back on, on classes in these specific areas. But they're not closed programs. Just in general, can you give me a number? How many um, folks in your programs are immigrants? Uh, I wouldn't have that number offhand. So it, I would imagine a large number, though. We don't tr well. We don't track information right. on immigrant status at all right. as students come in. We do ask <coughs> the country of origin uh, as a part of you know gender, age, some things that we ask on intake in terms of the state database. But we do not ask uh, questions about immigration or immigration status or anything to that. Well, I answer because I think a large number of the folks that are in the programs are probably immigrants. Well, I would just say to you that likely. ESOL students are likely people who have a native language from another country, so I would make that assumption. Well, and, and so what I was really going to get at is that the Center for Urban Future uh, ranks New York as 18th in uh, terms of uh, per adult funding for adult education. And so I think that's something that we really need to look at moving forward, uh, is to um, really find ways to continue to provide funding to ensure these programs particularly in light of what's going on in Washington, D.C., and providing those services to our immigrant communities is vitally important to them. So I'd like to really encourage that we, we look at that together a little bit further down the road. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So we have a lot of people who want to give testimony, so I'm going to, I'm going to stop here, and we'll follow up with other questions by mail, by letter to the agencies. But I do want to thank you all for coming in and providing testimony, and uh, we hope that you'll stick around to hear uh, some of the other testimony as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd now like to bring up Patty Crispino from the United Federation of Teachers and Sterling Roberson from the UFT as well. Just my name.
Okay, can I ask you to raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Okay, very good. Who would like to start? Okay, Mr. Robeson. First of all, good morning, Chairman Drum. It's uh, good to see you again, and it's great to be here uh, to talk about um, um, an important topic around uh, adult education and the uh, intro to um, 1195 in terms of reporting and having the mayor's office of operations uh, report around adult literacy programs. Uh, that becomes extremely important and obviously for us and the members that we represent, uh, particularly in adult education, um, it is important with regards to the conversation, but thank you and the council for having a, a leading voice in advocating for access and equity for our public schools, and in this case, um, having the conversation about um, the issues concerning adult education. So in my testimony, I'm gonna take, um, without reading the testimony verbatim, um, copies are being circulated, I'm going to take it into the three areas of focus, um, why adult education matters is number one, um, why listening is key, and the only way to move adult education forward is through collaboration. So I'm going to take those three um, aspects, and then um, following my testimony, my colleague, uh, Caddy Crispino, who represents the adult education chapter, will uh, conclude in that testimony. But very quickly, um, when we think about why adult um, ed matters, you heard the Department of Education about the demographics of the number of um, students, adult ed students in um, the population that they serve. Number one, the 60% of the students are ill that are below the level in terms of reading of grade six, 50% um, that are beginning in terms of uh, literacy, 80% um, folks of color, African American, Hispanics, 80% um, low income, average age 39. Those are some recaps and highlights that we see in terms of the demographics. We also talked about some of the labor which is included in my testimony with respect to the rate of pay, why it's important that um, the adult education um, exists. That is an extremely um, troubling, but, n but knowing that we have to prepare our adults. Also, these are individuals in New York and New Yorkers that have kids in our public school system and they deserve the, the best quality education and they represent not just their families, they represent their communities and the city of New York as well. Listening um, is being key. There's no secret that um, at times we disagree with the Department of Education on several different matters. Um, when it comes to adult education and many of its policies that has been instituted, um, some that has been highlighted today in terms of changing and testing, um, we have disagreed around how do we refer or counsel students out of programs, um, especially um, to other providers other than that. Um, making sure that there's access to quality programs. That's what we want for all of our students that deliver by certified teachers that have the skill sets because it's not just having a teacher, it's a teacher that has the skill set to be able to deliver um, adult education. Just like adolescent literacy, adult literacy, it requires a much different skill set. But let me just talk about our members. Many of them have submitted testimony anonymously. Many of them are going to testify today. Um, the difference between just the idea of teaching, this is not just for them teaching, it's a calling. The idea that the the conditions of their students is, is, is coupled with the working conditions that they deal with every single day. So the passion that they bring um, to the table and the skill sets that they bring, it only shows um, that these are important issues around what it is that they feel around what's going on and their voices um, needing to be heard. So with that in mind, when we think about the shifting of um, student populations, altering admissions criteria, of transitioning um, students to other programs. These kinds of issues are issues that are passionate for those that have been doing this work for a very long time. And if they're not included in the t at the table, 
you are going to get many of the responses that you have in terms of the passion that they bring about um, the input that they um, feel that is there. And I think it's important that these concerns matter. And the only way that we resolve those matters is through consultation with the Department of Education. So I just want to make sure that we I put that um, on the table so that folks actually understand that that becomes the case. Last but not least, the category of collaboration. Yes, there is a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of um, the testimony that was from the Department of Education and others in the city knows that with that work, there's a lot of things that need to be done. Prior to our contract, one of the things that's the highlight of our contract that was passed was educate a voice. Educate a voice is primary to our collective bargaining. And through that, we did convened um, meetings with the Department of Education. Some issues were resolved, but there's a lot of other issues that are outstanding. What we did in that convening, we also made sure that now we're going to make sure that we fast track some of the concerns from the adult ed chapter. The deal we agreed that they wanted to move in the right direction and expand um, the program. There's a lot of complexities. We highlighted it in the CTE, if you lose a teacher, what happens? So there's complexities all the way around, but the only way that we're going to do this as well as negotiate on some of these things is that we have to work together, but primarily it has to be a solution-driven approach to many of the issues. We talked, they, we heard about curricula, we heard about changes in the test, we heard about all of those things. It requires the educator voice, especially many of the, the teachers in the adult ed chapter, whether they are the full-time that were highlighted or the ones that come in part-time. No one should be left out of that conversation. So um, I am glad um, to be here to provide um, that particular, this portion of the testimony so that um, we have the context on what it is that uh, we deal with in terms of some of the challenges, but also what we need to do in terms of um, moving forward. So let me just turn over um, to my colleagues, Patty Crispino, um, for her testimony on this important matter. And I'm not as versed at doing this, so I'm going to read from my testimony. Uh, good day, Chairman Drum and members of the Education Committee. My name is Patty Crispino, and I'm a special representative for the Adult Education Chapter of the United Federation of Teachers. I want to thank you for this opportunity to offer, offer supplemental testimony to what you've just heard from Vice President Sterling Robinson on the city's adult literacy programs. The Department of Education's Office of Adult and Continuing Education runs more than 900 tu tuition-free classes in adult education basic education, high school equivalency, and ES English for, I'm sorry, English for speakers of other languages, career and technical education for adults 21 and above. The Department of Education's funding stream for an adult education program is largely dependent upon money from the state's employment preparation education program, currently commonly known as EPI. Through EPI, the state provides funds to public school districts as they can provide ed adults and with education opportunities leading to high school diploma or high school equivalency diploma. The EPI aid formula is based on valutation of property in a school district, meaning New York City has a much lower reimbursement rate than other localities and a cap on funding that limits services to high needs population. This cap negatively affects the ability of the city to serve the the adults who need to earn high school equivalency diploma or acquire English language skills to become contributing members to the community as taxpayers and consumers. We urge City Council to use its influence with the State Education Department to press for a greater equity in EPI funding for the City's adult education programs. Recently, at a UFT executive board meeting, one of our adult education chapter members spoke passionately about providing services to adults in the community, and I quote Roberta, they need our help. They need someone who is able to help them get from point A to point B. This, is this any more important mission in education than helping someone advance toward their goals regardless of their age? We know we're all in the same we're all on the same page when it comes to helping our communities with more equitable funding from the state we can make dreams come true for our neighbor for our neighbors thank you thank you very much i'm not going to um, ask too many questions it's just really an observation uh, because we are a little bit pressed for time we're supposed to be out of the room by 1 p.m. 
But um, number one, thank you and the U of T for your support. You know, I was a 25 year union chapter leader and I'm always very grateful for the work that the U of T does. Uh, and I did not know about this, what did you call EPE funding uh, formula? And Happy. that is something that we would like to, I would like to talk with you more about as well. Uh, because I, I ended my comments with the DOE about increased funding, particularly because of the communities that are affected by um, the services that are provided through adult education. So uh, that is something I'd like to, to look at a little bit further down the road. And also just to continue to press forward with the consultation items, I think some of the issues that the teachers have brought to us are issues that I've mentioned to you as well. Um, and that it, they're issues of major concern and importance to me as chair of the education committee. And I know that you're working on many of those issues. So I just want to thank you for coming in and giving your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, our next panel is Roberta Pikeser. Pixer, I'm sorry, Pixer. Tilla Alexander, Katie Naplatar Naplatarski, Donna Corral, Donna. And Betty Gottfried. Okay. The sergeant. Okay, I have to ask you to raise your right hand, please, so I can swear you all in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, who would like to start? Okay, down here. Everybody wants to start first. Well, let's start over here. Just make sure that mic is on and make sure you say your name. Push the red button. This one? Yep. Is it on now? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear. <laughs> Okay, thank you. My name is Betty Gottfried. I co-founded the Adult Ed Chapter nearly 50 years ago, and I served as its chapter leader for over 40 years. My statement is aims to give some historical perspective to the testimony you are about to hear today. OECE evolved from a group of great society programs that were formed in the 60s and 70s in response to the demands of the civil rights movement. The mission of these programs was to educate the disenfranchised, African Americans, Latinos, immigrants, school dropouts, and the poor. Working in conjunction with the teachers union, these programs merge to form an adult education program that provides teachers with a salary, licensure, and benefits commensurate with that of the K through 12 teachers. Licensure and benefits stabilize the program with qualified personnel and enable the teachers to develop curriculum, fight for their students' rights, and expand its full-time teaching staff. OECE's doors were open to all New York City adults aged 21 and above, non-readers, new language learners, high school equivalently candidates, and those seeking technical career training, teachers, administrators, state ed officials, and the Literacy Assessment Center worked together to create curricula that were suitable for the diverse populations OECE serves. Today, all of these projects have been scrapped by the current administration, which someone else following me will discuss further. The importance of certification. To create an effective literacy program, OECE set a policy with the approval of the union of interviewing teachers from its certified staff to be assigned to the lowest level readers. 
our certification, which is determined by our employer, not by our funding, which Ms. Mills has suggested, operated to ensure that these students got the best teachers. Because state law protects seniority rights of certified teachers, the director could not use these interviews to protect teachers he favored from layoff. Conversely, these protections discourage teachers from applying for these assignments in order to bypass seniority. Certification is a protection against cronyism and patronage. The current administration's position that EPI funding does not require a license or certification and hiring is open to supervisory whim has set the clock back 50 years. It's not only an unfair labor practice, it sends a disgraceful message to the students. You are not worthy of a qualified teacher. In a more pernicious move, the administration decided to move the lowest level students out of the program to the libraries because their gains were not advantageous to the program. What a message to send to the population of the city. The DOE is more interested in statistics than it is in people. At the other end of the spectrum is the high school equivalency diploma. Um, the GED exam replaced by the task has its origins in the Second World War. It was instituted to educate African Americans who were victims of the Jim Crow law so that they could help in the war effort. When there is a will to educate a disenfranchised population, it does get results. Today, access to the task is limited. The adult community believes that free access to the exam should be open to all. Finally, this body has a history, the, the council, of working with the union to support adult education. In 2006, the former chair of this committee, Robert Jackson, a recipient of the UFT's John Dewey Award and a strong supporter of adult education, worked with former teacher David Green and Calvin Miles, and I say with a heavy heart, the late Bob Ostrowski, whom we just lost on, on December 3rd, who was a great um, union member and, and and support of adult ed to pass a resolution that entered the Adult Education Bill of Rights into the permanent record of the City Council. I put it before you today. I gave you copies of the Bill of Rights. Um, and the items speak for themselves and ask you to reaffirm your support for the rights of these students and the rights of these teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for recalling the memory of Bob Ostrowski. As well, uh, he was a good friend and supporter, so yeah. thank you. Yeah. His death leaves quite a hole in our, our yeah. union. Thank you. Next, please. Let's go right down the, the, the row here. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is... Is the red light on? Is my... Oh. Sorry. There you yes. go. Good morning, still. My name is Roberta Pixer, and for 16 years I taught as an annualized teacher at the Office of Adult and Continuing Education. My purpose today is to give you an overview of the problems besetting the Office of Adult and Continuing Education. My written testimony deals with these matters in detail and my colleagues will deal with specific matters in detail. The first thing to understand and keep in mind is that teaching adults is a very different process from teaching children. Points in common do exist, but the adult learner is a formed individual with life experience and entrenched habits and perceptions. Additionally, returning to school can be very delicate and complicated psychologically. Under Superintendent Rosemary Mills, the program is being so badly mismanaged that one could characterize her administration as one of dismemberment. There is mismanagement of the teaching staff and of support staff. There's mismanagement of class schedules so that students are denied access to the education for which their taxes pay and so that teachers, especially experienced teachers, are obliged to work 12-hour split shift days. There are continual attempts to remove lower level students from the program, though it is mandated to be open to anyone over 21 years of age. There is refusal to deal with the pressing problems of immigrant students who are asked for their social security number or their work permit authorization at intake and who disappeared in droves from classes after January 20th of this year. There is at minimum an 8% contraction of a program for which there is increasing need. There is misrepresentation of testing data which may suggest fraud. 
and there is tremendous financial mismanagement and an opaque budget. If the goal of the program is to serve the students, one can truthfully say it is being dismembered. If the goal of the program is to create an expanding fiefdom, then perhaps it is a success. This program was established to serve the citizens of New York. Many immigrants, documented and undocumented, who have lived here, worked hard, and paid taxes for many years have improved their lives and the lives of the rest of us through their studies at the program. Many have become U.S. citizens, but all of our students, immigrants and native-born, are citizens of New York City. They deserve the best that the city can give them as they give the best of themselves to it. They deserve more classes, not exclusion from the program. They need a proper education so they can help their children with schoolwork. They deserve experienced teachers and staff so they can get a quality education. They deserve an education arising from respect for what they know and who they are. They do not deserve to be treated as ciphers in a database, a mere source of money which is then squandered. It is impermissible for the Department of Education and the Chancellor to allow this mistreatment of students and staff to continue. Experienced staff must not be harassed and fired. The program must be expanded, not dismembered. We must have free adult education for all who desire it. If Superintendent Mills and her superiors are unwilling to serve the people of the City of New York, they must be replaced by those who will do so. Thank you very much. Next, please. I'm going to read quite fast, actually. And I have other documents as evidence of some things I say. Uh, dear council members and Councilman Drom, thank you for holding this hearing regarding adult literacy in New York City and seeking to ensure the accountability of New York City literacy providers. A 27-year DOE teacher, I was with OAC for 25 years, the last five as an instructional facilitator which deals with curriculum and materials, books, um, and staff development. I transferred out of OAC two years ago and currently work with another DOE division as an academic coach itinerant. I would like to shed light on the following issues, which I know through personal experience and keeping my ear close to the ground for the past two years. Task test numbers. Only 316 diplomas were earned in 2015 out of 30,000 students. I taught the task test for my current program and the excuse that it the new test is harder, it's not valid as a reason for this low number. In fact, last year, the program I am currently with earned 1,700, 1,700 diplomas out of 7,000 enrolled. It's an ESL program and a BE program. OEC severely lacks task fund staff development. It lacks staff development for the task test or a process in place or implemented in order for students to progress through the task process or up through the class ranks. To quote a teacher from Susan Edelman's post article, there is no feedback, no support, curric no curriculum. We are left to our own devices, and that is still true. Case in point, in 2015, I witnessed that the principal at Brooklyn Adult Learning Center had the mandatory test practice test locked in her office cabinet until April of the, of the school year. She took them out only when a Saturday class threatened mutiny. In addition, according to current staff, the scheduling of these mandatory tests often goes by the wayside and students languish in class or leave. Students soon learn that OEC no longer has the task test as a priority. If they are applying on their own, their applications are pulled, pulled by the task. If they apply on their own, they're pulled by the task department, which is run by OEC. They pull their applications. Standardized testing policy, now talking about the standardized, the post-test that the students take, <clears throat> NESL and BE. OACE is out of compliance with federal and state testing policy. <clears throat> Uh-oh, I'm missing a page. Here we go, sorry. State and federal guidelines, state and federal guidelines state that students should not, should take the test after a minimum of 40 instructional hours. At yet, program-wide, OAC systematically, systematically post-test students at 12 hours, including instructional intake hours. And I have, I have evidence right here of a memo from this year. Numerous teachers have stated that this is common practice for the past few years. All one needs to do is look into assist to find evidence clear as day. 
OSCE's See success is questionable. The present administration, in large part, justifies its leadership practices by its success on this testing, but the ratings are obviously does not follow the testing guidelines. The testing data is not legitimate. <clears throat> Mismanagement. Teachers and other staff, staff are not respected, valued, or supported. Virtually all focus is on standardized testing in order to get a good rating. Teachers teach the test and are hounded by data trackers, I just spoke to somebody last night, who daily and relentlessly order for students to be tested in the classroom during instruction or uh, the teacher has to give the uh, best test while the students, who knows what they're doing. Part-time and full-time teachers have left in droves often mid-year, and to institutional memory is gone, years to build back up. Community building is nearly non-existent, retention is not focused. Since students are tested after just 12 hours, there's little motivation <clears throat> in retaining students. Students are often frustrated because they have no chance to progress to a higher level class due to OAC arbitrary testing rules. Once they have tested in math and shown gain, they might not take another test, reading test for months and can't advance, say, to a task class. Rank and file is not consulted, not consulted on educational matters and materials. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were wasted in the administration's first six months on the purchase of useless materials which are still in the basement of the learning centers. One teacher told me last night that the books and CDs are still hanging around. Five years later, I can't even be given away. And we were not consulted. And I was part of the team that should have been consulted. And there wasn't, what we once, <clears throat> we once had, what was once an excellent learning institution is now a mill. Years of complaints and cries for help have gone unheard. DOE passes the buck of blame to the state saying OSCE is under the state's guidance. It has so far protected the administration, ignoring the writing on the wall and damage being done. The administration's leadership style may be characterized as abusive, disrespectful, mean, non-collaborative, arrogant, dictatorial, and tyrannical. One might say it lacks creativity, innovation, vision, and one might say heart. If one is unlucky enough to be in the crosshairs of this administration, one might call it a reign of terror. Seriously, it's that bad. And if you I, could just yes. wrap it up okay, a little so bit. That's, that's it. I'm just, my last points are <clears throat> that council members, please, would further investigate and also partner with the state to look into those that testing practices because it's right in there. And, and Katie, okay. thank you, thank you for your testimony. Thank it's you very, very much. Very powerful. As you know, we are doing this at, at because you folks came to us, and that's I'm the so beginning of the process. And right. I just want to state, though, also some of the charges that you make are very serious, mm -hmm. and I think that you should report them to OSI if you have not already. I done would so. love to do that, and if the council could help us or steer us in how to do that and there are many people who can speak to this because I've spoken to many people and many of the people sitting here know these things and I think that would be just fantastic and I really really appreciate um, and some of the things that you did bring up I did ask DOE some of the things they were not able to answer today yes some of the things they will get back to us on and yes. we'll make that public as well yes and I very much appreciate the questioning that you did I do have and I will um, give to you. This is uh, the memo, which is about testing schedule yes. for one whole region um, and shows that it's not 40 to 60 hours. We have some other memos available too. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate it. Okay, next please. Um, good morning, Chairman uh, Drum and members of the Educational Committee. My name is Dana Corolle. I have been teaching for the Office of Adult and Continuing Education for 30 years. I have been a master teacher, a curriculum developer, an instructional coach, providing professional development to teachers and administrators, and lately I have represented teachers as their chapter leader in our program. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today and to bring some of my concerns regarding administrative decisions made by OACE leadership. Um, did you know that our current principals, all of the newly hired assistant principals and instructional coaches None of them have any experience working with adult learners. It is their responsibility to make decisions that impact our students and the quality of classroom instruction they receive. For example, 
A decision to eliminate low-level literacy students out of our program is particularly disturbing. Such a decision could have only made by those who have never had to look in the eyes of a desperate, scared adult student, one who knows this is his or her last chance to learn to read and write. No teacher should ever have to say to their student, sorry, but you cannot stay in my classroom. My boss doesn't allow me to teach you. I implore you do not accept our administrator's argument that the state doesn't provide the funds for non-literate students or that there just isn't enough money or time, that a less expensive adult ed program in the city can serve this population. Demand that OACE redirect its funds from a top heavy administrative staff back to the students who need us, the teachers, the most. Thank you. Thank you very much. I did not know that the principals do not have a None. background in adult education. So it's very interesting. Thank you. Next, please. Good day, Chairman Drum and committee members. My name is Tilla Alexander. After 20 plus years of teaching ESOL to adults for the Office of Adult and Continuing Education, the last 16, at the Mid-Manhattan Adult Learning Center, which was a showcase for our formerly esteemed program, I decided to retire, partly due to my age, but also because I have found it demoralizing and oppressive to remain. I will share from my perspective the many positive aspects of our program as it used to be, which proved to be so beneficial to both teaching and learning. I will then contrast that with how our program has declined in quality, specifically over the past five years, and the negative impact this has had on teachers and students. Uh, we have had previously a lot of support from both administrative and central office staff, teaching and administrative. I would not have been able to accomplish all that I had and become, be a successful teacher to my intermediate ESOL students without the support from both administration and other staff at OACE. We previously had collaboration within and without our program. We, collab we collaborated with LAC and we had a large representation in Symph All Right Symphony Space writing program and the NYU Literacy Review. So, what has changed? We now have non-existent or low quality support at best. In fact, we sometimes feel like we're going it all alone. We have inadequate professional development offerings, mainly focused on data, given by incompetent or unlicensed professionals with no teacher involvement, which used to make them enriching. We have no encouragement to reach out of the box and collaborate with other educational groups. Ne now, very few teachers are involved in the All Right Symphony Space Project, and I was, this year, I was the only teacher represented at Literacy Review. The activities at our school became very top-down, where our assemblies and programs were truly collaborative, and teachers could self-select. Now the administration chooses the program agenda and the teachers and students to be selected for that program. Whereas before teachers were encouraged to develop activities and flexibility based on student needs, now the administration is dictating topics as well as 
a pacing schedule. Whereas before quality of instruction and creativity were most important, now data and testing are paramount to the administration. Whereas before the OAC, the professional community met together three times a year for stimulating all-day workshops where there was much collegial sharing of ideas, methods, materials, and experiences. Now, by contrast, we are divided by our eight regions for such all-day professional development where we are fed narrow and rigidly designed instructional mandates from the top down. Whereas before we had a cohesive program where teachers and students felt valued, now teachers come to school apprehensive and battle fatigued. The students sense all of this while not understanding what is behind this. Whereas before all ESL teachers were licensed by the city and state, now main, many new ones lack ESL certification. I conclude in the last five years, Ms. Rosemary Mills has taken over since she has taken over as superintendent, OACE has been in professional decline and deterioration. Experienced, licensed, innovative teachers have been denigrated and unsupported by the administration. What was once a stellar program, one that used innovative, forward-looking methods, is now a shell of its former self. Our students deserve more. Thank you very much, and I appreciate um, all that you've said. Uh, your emotion in this is clear and evident, and um, as I said before, we are just beginning to look at this issue, and we will be following up on it very, very soon. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Okay, our next panel will be Herbert Hodge. Yeah, it's going to be a combination of some teachers and other uh, providers and recipients. Herbert Hodge from ACE, New York. Luz Rojas from Make the Road, New York. Stephanie Varner Mene, Menene. Um, and uh, Diane Jenkins. So we have uh, two additional panels after this. If you have not, uh, if you want to speak and have not turned in your form, please make sure that you've done that. Okay, so I need to, um, oh, we're missing someone. Oh, okay, good. Okay, if I could ask you to raise your right hand. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, do you swear, do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, and I also want to state that we have been joined by council member Ben Kalos as well. Who would like to start on the panel? Yes. You just need to make sure that red light is on. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Luz Rojas, Senior Manager of Adult Literacy at Made the Road, New York. With over 20,000 members, Made the Road is the largest grassroots immigrant organization in New York City. At Made the Road, we work every day to build the power of Latino and working class communities to achieve dignity and justice. Thank you to all members of the, of the Education Committee for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. First, I want to thank you for investing $12 million for adult literacy in this fiscal year. Adult literacy is important for full participation in our society. Literacy is connected to everything to employment, school performance, health, immigration, and very important to us to community involvement. Without enough adult literacy classes, 
many immigrants are unable to reach their full potential and our communities and our cities suffer. We are grateful to you for introducing this bill which aims to evaluate the need for adult literacy services in New York City. We understand that in order to direct more funding for adult literacy, we need to demonstrate the need for our services. In a way, the DYCD has, has done a good job to help us with this. We were not surprised to see that DYCD's community need assessment from this past June found that across the city, adult literacy services were ranked as one of the areas of greatest need. Based on our experience, this is not at all a surprise. Major Road New York currently runs over 25 classes a week for 500 students a cycle across four offices with a combination of city, state, and private funding. We enroll students quarterly and maintain waiting lists in all our, our offices to try to maintain a sense of the need. At any given point, we can have waiting lists between 50 to 400 potential students, depending on the location of the office and the kind of class. Keeping waiting lists can be challenging for programs because we don't want to give people false hope that we will have seats for any classes in the near future. Sometimes we just don't have a class at a level or time that works for them. We believe that together we can best demonstrate the need for classes by looking at existing practices like DYCD's own community needs assessments, as well as samples, waiting lists, surveys of program administrators, among other things. We also encourage the Council to work to establish an adult literacy task force and a major's office for adult literacy again, which could gather information on need, but to also work to reinforce the adult literacy system in a long-term and a strategic way. We are eager to work with you to come up with a simple and effective way for capturing and sharing info about the need for adult literacy classes. Our hope is to engage in a data gathering process that's limited and makes a strong case for these services, but doesn't create a large additional administrative work for programs. Thank you again, Education Committee members, for your time today. We at Major Road, New York, look forward to working together with you this year. Thank you very much, and I hear you very loudly about the administrative burden that might be placed on you, because that was an issue for me when I was a New York City public school teacher as well. Thank you, and thank you to Make the Road for coming in. You're uh, Mr. Hodge, would you like to start? Just if you make sure that red light is on on your mic. Chest. And pull the mic over to you, to your mouth. There you go. Good morning. Um, good afternoon. My name is Herbert Hodge. Uh, I'm 64 years old. I'm 64 years old. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I came from what you would call a dysfunctional family. I had problems and I didn't know how to cope. I went to school until the 10th grade, but by that time I was making all the wrong choices and I paid a heavy price. I won't go into too much detail, but from the time I left school, I was moving around on the streets. I was homeless a few times, sometimes by choice and sometimes because I had nowhere to go. Eventually I made up my mind to get some help and give myself a break. I've been living here in New York since the end of 2013. I came to New York to receive treatment for a drug, pro a drug problem. At that time, I needed some help 
and encouragement to continue to try and be a better person. Through the treatment center, I heard about ACE. They offered me different classes, encouraged me to find employment, to save my money, and to get a roof over my head. The courses I took at ACE considered of math, reading, and computers, and they brought a lot of what I had forgotten when I was in school. When I was in the computer class, we were learning about punctuation and grammar to help us on our resumes. I still have a lot to learn, but I am better than I was before. Back then, I didn't know what button to push to turn the computer on. Now I use the computer every day to update the sanitation track and spreadsheet with what I did, where I was, and what I saw on the different sanitation routes. You have to know how to read in order to get around. You have to understand how to navigate the subways and the bus routes. I learned some of those basic skills at ACE, like reading a map and how to pronounce and understand words and their meanings. I use these basic skills every day. I'm glad that I utilized the services at ACE. They gave me the tools to be satisfied and to be, a product and, and to be productive, and that is what I had always wanted to do. I wanted to make an investment in myself and complete my education. After a few months in ACE's program, I got hired by ACE to do sanitation. Working started to become the natural thing to do. I let my supervisor know that I liked the work, which consists of cleaning the streets and plazas and providing maintenance. After that, I got hired full time and I couldn't believe it. I never thought it would be this easy. I now have to work, I know I have to work for everything I have, but I could never have imagined that in three years, I would be in a position where I am a supervisor, working with the staff in the field and reporting to the organization. I'm helping other guys, giving them suggestions on how to do a better job and sharing my experience. Right now, I work five days a week. Within the last three months, I have received a promotion to supervisor. I have been employed going on four years. Everything I learn in the classes, I use every day to some degree. In addition to work, I continue to go to school to get my GED and I'm going to get my high school diploma, even if it takes me three to four times to pass the test. That will open more doors, and there's no telling how far I can go. I feel that I'm on the right track, and that I'm going in the right direction. Don't ask me what direction that is, but I know it's the right direction. <laughs> Ace opened up a lot of doors for me. They gave me hope. They showed me that I can do it, and that I have the tools to make it. I graduated from ACES Project Comeback over three years ago, and now I have money in the bank and positive people in my life. I have regrets, but I know that is what I had to go through to get where I am today. I am a better person, and I am satisfied with who I am. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you to the council for allowing me to share this today. Thank you very much, Mr. Hodge. You are just, let's. You are truly an inspiration and a power of example of how people can turn their lives around. And I know that firsthand because you worked in my district. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm very appreciative <laughs> for all that you did. And the only thing that I can say is that I think it's a shame that you got a promotion because that meant that they took you out of my district. <laughs> but now as the supervisor of some of the men in my district, you're doing uh, even a bigger job and ensuring other people get the same benefit that you had. So congratulations to you. And you are, as I said, a power example of the power of learning to read and becoming literate and what it can do to change people's lives. Exactly. Thank you again for coming in today. All right. Okay. Next, please. Okay, me? Yeah, whatever. Who okay, yeah, hi, I'm Stephanie Vaughn I'm, I'm a retired teacher from OACE. I worked from, I, I started as a parent in 1976. I left and came back in 1982 as a uh, full-time teacher, and I retired in 2014. Um, I presently work as a volunteer, too, for some of the, some of the former OACE students. Why? Because um, some of the students have not been constantly complaining to me 
I did some of my old students and some and some of them brought their friends that all they see is tape tests. Um, these are motivated students who want a high school diploma for advancement, for post-secondary vocational training, for college admissions, and for personal satisfaction. Most of my students left OACE because they wanted to take the TAS test. Instead, they were given a tape test. The tape test didn't bring them any closer to getting their TAS diploma. While the TAS can provide some assessment information, the TAPE score is no substitute for a high school diploma. Overtesting is a waste of time when and testing is overdone. Most of my students, most of the students who I'm presently to have passed the TAS test, but they're not part of the OACE total because they stopped attending classes at OACE locations. I think it's sad because um, a lot of us who were retired, were, they've made it difficult for us to return and work as work in the program. Instead of having, um, and I don't want to be negative towards my colleagues, teachers who don't have any um, high school equipment experience, you have people who work in other areas. I started working in OACE when I was very, very young. And I just want to say is that it's a disservice because I still get calls from students who, because I basically, I volunteer every other Saturday. And, um, and I, I can only take a small group at a time because I'm in volunteer space. I think something needs to be done also to rectify what has been done to some of the older teachers. Some of, some of this, our spirits have been crushed and we want to contribute, but who wants to go to a building where you're gonna be humiliated, talked down to, and really made to feel like a piece of crap? I love OACE. OACE has provided a lot for me, but also I've, I'm, with my students, the thing that really touched me was some of my OACE students are now colleagues. They're teachers now. Some of my OAC students are registered nurses. I see them at Kings County Hospital. I see them at the city hospitals. Why can't we continue to do this? Why must, you, why must, must, why must teachers be treated like crap? My focus is please do something. Look at, look at the administration deeply. Look, who, look, look at the people supervising us. They don't know anything about us. It's a paycheck for them. For me, it wasn't a paycheck. It was a living. That's why I give up my Saturdays, my every other Saturday to two the students. And if you need a list of them, I can get you a list. But they left the way CE. And it's sad because some of my colleagues here contributed. Well, they were lower level ABE students. And some of them have reached the task level. But because of what's going on, they can't continue. Some of my colleagues deserve the accolades from bringing these students to, them, to where they are now. Thank you very much, and I want to assure you we're listening and we're hearing it and we're going to act on it. And as soon as we get those numbers, we'll have more information for you as well. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon, everyone. How is everybody feeling? I don't hear you. How you doing? You feel good? I feel good because finally we're getting this mess out in the open. Thank you very much, Mr. Drum. Thank you very much, Education Committee, for having me. I'm going to look at um, the mission of the adult ed program and how it's not reaching its goals because of the Mills misadministration. Adult education needs true, accountable, andragogic leadership of the largest state education program in New York State. Leadership who actually brings the same type of compassion, dedication, experience to a program that is dedicated adult education teachers have demonstrated for decades. Now you may ask me, well, why? Why? Because of the population we serve. 1.6 million people in New York City do not have a high school diploma. Most of our, our, um, citizens, our students come in and they're reading on a very low level. Many of our students come in, they cannot speak English properly, they don't know the, the ins and out workings, okay? When you have a population like this, the thing that you are supposed to provide is sanctuary, and only the way that we can provide that sanctuary if we are able to do what we are supposed to do, and we're not allowed to do that, okay? 
the Office of Adult and Continuing Education mission is to empower adults in their roles as parents, family members, workers, community members, etc. And we promote lifelong learning. We never stop learning. I hope you never did. I keep learning every day. All right? And the development of problem solving skills through the continuum of services, including adult basic education, ESOL, high school preparation, and career and technical education programs. Now, how can we do this without providing qualified, experienced adult education administrators? How can we do this if our program consists of mean-spirited K through 12 administrators who know absolutely nothing about adult education? How can we do this if a teacher demonstrated that kind of insensitive, selfish, narcissistic, unilateral behavior in their classroom, their students would have long walked out and given them a U rating. This time on a program of 40,000 students per year deserves better than an arrogant, incompetent, and dishonest administration. How do I abuse the, let me count the ways. On my first day, I came and I said, it's my way or the highway. I have a central office made up of numerous administrators with substantive salaries, with many of them knowing absolutely nothing about adult ed. How are you going to administrate what you don't know? An administration who cuts hours and classes for ordering principals to give unsatisfactory ratings to their teachers. Who loves you? I love you. How do we do this if I make you cringe every time by having my administrators call your students children when the average age is 39? How can we do this when administrators are an unwelcome comp combination of inexperience, incompetence, and program damage? How can we do this when the meaning of andragogy is confused with pedagogy? How can we do this when, as soon as new hires understand how they were bullied and mistreated, they're out of there? I can't even count, Mr. Drum, over the last three years, how many people came in, they saw the horizon, and they left. How can we do this when administration forces senior staff to train the new hires? How can we do this when students are placed incorrectly in classes levels one through four because the person placing them does not know the difference because they have not been properly trained and they have not been in the program, know nothing about adult ed? How can we do this when the administration forces forces non-certified staff to administer TAVE and Best Plus tests, do new student intake, score tests, interview and place students, prescribe tests. All of this has to be done by a certified person who knows adult education. And that's not what's happening. How can we can do this? I can just ask you to wrap up, okay? Okay. How can we do this when the administration indulges in nepotism and favoritism? And lastly, how can we do this when community coordinators and community assistants are allowed to do payroll when they should be doing outreach? This program is mismanaged by K through 12 educators who know nothing about this program and is dying as a result. Which is unfortunate. Thank you again for coming in. We look forward to continuing to work with you on this issue, and uh, we appreciate your testimony. Thank, Thank you, you to everyone Thank on the you. panel. Thank you. All right, our next panel is Marsha. Uh, Biederman. And Marsha is also going to be um, showing a video of some students, I believe. Yeah. Okay, uh, Nancy Simon, Lisa Miller, and Loreen Cunningham.
Oh, I'm sorry. And we also want to announce that we've been joined by Councilmember Mark Levine and Councilmember Edonis Rodriguez. Thank you for being here. And we were joined by Councilmember Inez Barron, but she has now left to go to another hearing. Okay, can I get you to raise your right hand? So I can swear you in. All right. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Yes. Marcia, would you like to go, Marcia? Uh, yes, Marcia. Um, so, uh, good day, Chairman Drum and committee members. My name is Marcia Biederman, and I retired one year ago from teaching English as a second language in the Office of Adult and Continuing Education. Many of my ESL students had never gone to school in their native countries. I taught them not only English, but also how to read and write. In June 2014, my colleagues and I became aware of a new policy that would have shunted these students away from the OACE sites to classes in the public libraries. And I have an exhibit which was one of the colleagues, the case managers, had the evidence. Principals, please, it's exhibit one. Principals, please recommend your low-level students to these adult education classes and New York Public Library. It was the same in Brooklyn and probably the same in Queens. Uh, and the DOE never, never denied this. Uh, so I contacted the Brooklyn Public Library where the director of adult education programs told me that no one at the DOE had discussed this seismic shift with him. Moreover, he pointed out that although the Brooklyn Public Library offers learn to read classes, they're designed for native speakers or those with native-like English proficiency. They're not for students struggling with both the language and as well as basic literacy. Hence, the students were not so much being referred as being rejected. Uh, and then this is addressing uh, Council Member Menchaca's bill. How are non-literate ESL students identified? It's actually not through an exam. In some cases, their low skills become evident as soon as the teacher writes on the board. The intake exam for ESL, I just want to depart from the, the script for a minute, is purely oral. It's all reading, it's all speaking and listening. So it's not immediately evident in some cases that the student is non-literate. Uh, some other students request ABC classes or they struggle to sign their names. And intake workers ask about years of school attended. In the case of my students, the answer was often zero. In the past, OACE teachers would find a way to work with them, ideally in a specialized class. Now they were being shown the door. In correspondence with Chancellor Carmen Farina's office, and I have exhibits two and three, and discussions with OACE Superintendent Rosemary Mills, we were told that state funding requires non-literate students to be served not by our program, but by the libraries, which receive ALE, or Adult Literacy Education Funding. So that, that, those are exhibits two and three. We were very disappointed. We, we, uh, you see in Exhibit 2 that the, count, the Chancellor's strategic response book just said that's how it is, they get AL funding. But if you'll jump to Exhibit 4, in fact, the libraries did not get AL funding, at least not as reported by the state. So this, this was the pretext or excuse given both by our superintendent and unfortunately, to our great disappointment by the Chancellor's Office, which, and there seems to be some sort of contradiction here, because in the reporting um, I have, I can't show it to you, but you know there's a school report card for adult education. Uh, it says AL funding no for the New York and Brooklyn Public Libraries. Uh, it, eventually, it, Ms. It could be that they get city funding, and that's what the DOE might be referring to. But they wrote AL funding. They wrote what? They wrote a, this is from the Chancellor's 
I have to go by the evidence. Mm -hmm. Exhibit two is precisely what we received from the Chancellor's Strategic Response Group. I, I see. You, okay. If you see the circles it. in Exhibit 2, the I areas I've circled, they stated AIL funding several times. It was also, this was repeated to us in uh, meetings that we had with, with the superintendent. So I don't think it was a slip of the tongue, um, Council Member Drum. Eventually, Ms. Mills agreed to let me continue with my existing non-literate students, provided they were making educational gain. Sympathetic intake staffers enrolled or kind of snuck in additional new students, but access to education should be a matter of policy, not empathy. I don't know what happened after I was gone, and I can't count the number of students who were turned away because there was no tracking of the students who were turned away, and that would be useful, and I think that's what the, what Council Member Menchaca's bill is, is, is proposing. Uh, and even as all this was happening, the OAC stated on its website, and this is uh, Exhibit 5, that the classes were open to anyone over age 21 with no additional requirements. Uh, now, my, I'll let my students Speak for, them, speak for themselves here. Uh, they knew that they were under threat, and I asked them if they want to record something, and I hope the sound is on, and if we can get sound. Okay, I'm going to have to turn up the volume. I'm sorry, very sorry. Uh, here, perhaps. Okay, I also have, the su I also have subtitles. So, they're just little speakers. Uh, why did you come to this school? Something about reading and writing? And you want to know how to read and write? Yes. So, in Ghana, did you go to school in your country? Why not? Because my family don't have the money. And you, have, you need money in Ghana to go to school. Yeah. So this, so this was this class here at Brooklyn Adult Learning Center. This is your first school. Yeah. And what's your name? Right. And what country are you from? I'm from Mauritania. And did you go to school in Mauritania? No, I'm not. Why not? When you came here, you went to school in my class. This is the. And did you learn much? Did you learn something in my class? Okay. Okay. So now, uh, this school may never have a reading and writing class for for ESL students. How do you feel about that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very powerful. Next, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Lisa Miller, and I am a former OACE teacher. I was discontinued um, in 2016. And I want to just talk a little bit about how um, the observation reports are used to, to uh, denigrate and urate and fire teachers and how they are irrational and not ev evidence-based. Okay, so what happens to a teacher who is sensitive to her students, to her students' needs in OACE? What do you think? Class. <laughs> what happens to her? Okay, I'll tell you. She gets fired, that's what happens to her. I was faulted for not differentiating for the single student that was in my class. Not differentiating for one student. How do you do that? I was urated and scolded because I didn't say turn and talk to your partner. And I have been given a list of demands and expectations for one lesson so as to make the lesson so convoluted that it would make the lesson completely unmanageable and incoherent. I was falsely accused of not having a lesson plan for a formal observation. 
a specialist has come into my room who herself was uh, urated to remediate me. Another one who had no experience with either adult education or ESL demonstrated an appallingly bad model lesson that lacked any coherence whatsoever and did not address my alleged de deficiencies. She did not group the students appropriately, nor did she differentiate. She did not check for comprehension or say, turn and talk to your partner. Not only did she not know how to construct and deliver an ESL lesson, but I suspect she found it just as unmanageable to satisfy all the demands that the principal required in one lesson. I was supposed to model my lessons on this. I have been demeaned and harassed mercilessly by, by hostile supervisors and have, who have brought me to tears. But mine is not an isolated case. Similar irrational observation reports, non -ev not evidence-based, were used against other senior teachers to order, in order to justify U ratings. The clear targeting of OACE senior teachers by Superintendent Mills began in 2013, uh, 12 and 13, when she came on. Ms. Bernard, who is a, was a uh, principal in, in um, who is a principal in the Bronx where I worked, uh, meted out U ratings to the majority of senior teachers with decades of satisfactory, even exemplary experience in adult education, ESL, and BE. One of the U rated GE teachers covered her walls with copies of GEDs. An ESL in the U rated group. An ESL uh, teacher in the U-rated group had mentored new, stu new teachers in how to teach basic literacy skills to ESL students, yet all Bernard could do was denigrate their skills. This past year, the hostile work environment was dri has driven a number of Bronx teachers to leave before the end of the school year. The revolving door of teachers is harmful to our students, is, is is as harmful to our students as the loss <laughs> the revolving door of teachers is harmful to our students as is the loss of experienced teachers the u ratings of senior teachers has become more widespread with each passing year of the mills administration this year 24 teachers who were u rated for the 1617 school year Came to the I Manhattan have to ask you to wrap it up a little bit because we have to be out of here in 10 minutes. Okay, I, I just have like a little, just a tiny bit left. About that. Um, the, we're, came to the Manhattan office of the UFT to file appeals. The youngest were in their 40s and the majority were in their 50s and 60s. More teachers in other boroughs were U-rated as well. The number of U-ratings in our relatively small program compared to the K-12 schools is shocking. Furthermore, the preponderance of U ratings are reserved for the most experienced teachers. Some PK-12 teachers gave up their tenure to work in OACE and were especially vulnerable as senior teachers without tenure. A number of these senior teachers got letters of discontinuation. The targeting and loss of experienced teachers does great damage to the student population OACE is supposed to serve. And that's it. Thank you. I want to assure you we're going to look at the issue of the senior teachers being pushed out. We're going to look at that issue. Thank you. Next, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nancy Simon, and uh, mine is about excessive unsatisfactory ratings for OACE teachers. Um, I am a recently retired teacher who worked for the New York City Department of Ed for many years. I taught ESL in the adult education program for the latter half of my career, OACE. It was truly a stimulating and pleasurable experience teaching this subject to these students. I will be focusing on teachers here, but that always implies students. At the very core of this mammoth educational system is the teacher-student relationship. Without this duo, there is nothing to which the rest can be attached. Given that teachers are half of this core, I have to ask, why are they treated so badly under Superintendent Mills' leadership? I am at this hearing to speak to the alarming and demoralizing increase in unsatisfactory annual ratings that have been unfairly dealt to too many experienced and effective teachers, which began when Ms. Mills became the superintendent of OACE in 2012. These unsatisfactory or U ratings have risen far beyond past norms. They have also far exceeded the ineffective ratings given to our teacher counterparts in the pre-K through 12th grade system. The following is a comparison of the ratings for these two groups of teachers for the school years 2013 to 14 through 2016 to 17, that's four years, 
Um, for the, first, the annual ratings of PK through 12th grade teachers are taken from a New York State Education Department report. And there's a copy here. Uh, anybody can see on their website. It's all published. Um, this is page 13 of the report. So um, the report shows that 1% of New York City teachers received an ineffective rating for the 2013 to 14 through 2015 to 16 school years. The 2016 to 17 ratings are not yet available, but I have heard that ineffective ratings seem to have diminished. Therefore, I've estimated an across-the-board ineffective rating of 1% for the past four years for PK through 12th grade teachers. Unfortunately, data on OACE teachers' unsatisfactory ratings is more difficult to obtain. The numbers for 2013 to 14 and 2014 to 15 were finally obtained by a Freedom of Information Act letter. Um, oddly, a freedom, the, this uh, carbon copy type uh, Freedom of Information Act, or F FOIL, request for the same information for 2015 to 16 was denied. Oh, okay, so there's a copy of the denial as well for the same information. Um, but there is a new request pending. However, our understanding of the 2016-17 number is well informed. At the end of June, most of the U-rated teachers attended an emergency meeting at the UFT to file their appeals. Word got around of the high number of U-ratings because it was so shocking. Now this is where I'm going to, I was a little shocked at this hearing to hear, I think it was Vernon, uh, cite the number of full-time teachers as 147, because I took the directory that was sent to us in May, uh, I was still teaching up until, you know, the summer, um, and we went through it and culled through it and got rid of all the procession people and all the duplicates. These were teachers that had classes, full-time. I, my count is 189, and I include teacher line, because they are teachers and they get U rated too. Those are case managers and instructional facilitators. So what I'm going to say here, my numbers, and then I did the quick math on his numbers, which makes the U ratings even worse, but okay. So um, uh, to get the percentage, I took account of full-time or non-procession OACE teachers based on last year's class directory adding in all full-time teacher line personnel, case managers, and instructional facilitators. This came to a total of 189 teachers. This number should closely approximate the previous three years, so it is used to calculate the percentages of U-rated teachers. Okay, here we go with my figures. Um, 2000, uh, these are the percentages of OECE. Teachers rated unsatisfactory are as follows. 2013 to 14, 13 teachers, 7% were rated unsatisfactory. Remember, PK through 12, 1%. Uh, 2014 to 15 school year, FOIL result again, 9% of OACE teachers were rated unsatisfactory. 2015 to 16, not available, FOIL rejected, another one is pending. 2016 to 17 school year, 14% um, of teachers were U rated. That was 27 teachers got unsatisfactories. Um, now with the numbers that I got from Vernon, um, I just quickly tried to do 2016 to 17, 27 U's, if we indeed have 147 full-time teachers, that makes it 18% were you rated, okay? And then uh, 2014 to 15, we had 17 U's, you know, and my figure said what? Um, that was 9% you rated. Well, it's 12%. So you can see, I guess we got to get those numbers figured out because they never. Okay, I just have a few more couple right, of paragraphs. Just if you could okay. wrap it up. Yeah, I, I worked I, hard on this, and people. Okay, <laughs> I know. I just got right. I'm being. I, I try to give hard data, and you know, these numbers, especially last year's, are in stark contrast to one percent ineffective ratings for non-OACE teachers. What these numbers do not tell are the many stressful and painful experiences endured by individuals throughout the year in such a hostile work environment. Although the negative impact is probably felt most by those who were given an unsatisfactory rating, it is certainly not limited to them. I, I did not get a U rating, but I felt I, I had a lot of this, you know, a lot of us do. Along with the annual U ratings, there have been an excessive number of observations that are rated unsatisfactory throughout the year, given both to teachers who end up with unsatisfactory and satisfactory annual ratings. 
The harsh and sometimes absurd critiques that follow often seem to have no rhyme or reason and do not reflect the reality experienced by the teacher and students, not the enthusiastic participation in learning activities or the students' demonstrable achievements. I will close by saying that I hope these words and those of others on this topic will have a meaningful impact. Such poor treatment of teachers is not healthy for the teachers, the students, or anyone working in the program. OACE leadership truly needs change. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll look at your numbers too if you want to give us your numbers. I, I attached, um, I had, of course, I had many copies of the testimony and then you should have, if you have five sheets, that you have everything. Okay. I, I ran out so then some people just get the testimony. Well, give me your quick numbers too. I want the numbers that you were doing while you were here. Oh, on sure. Well, what he yeah. was saying as well. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so it has the attached. Yeah, but the, but the numbers that you were figuring too so I can work off of those numbers. Yes, okay. yes. I All right, thank you. Okay. Next, please. Good afternoon. My name is Lorene Cunningham. I was a OACE education officer. I recently retired. I retired this past February. I have been a part of OACE for 24 years and have gone through many administrations and this last one has been a real challenge in terms of the workload and what we are seeking to get. Speaking on, just as a point of reference for you, you had questioned that you said you never, you weren't aware of the EPI. The EPI, each one of our students garners $8.43 per hour that they sit in a classroom so that they're in there for a morning class of three hours, it's $25 and change, and for a three-day, $227, and for a five-day class, $379. So it's like they've gone to work, and that's how we're garnering and getting our money. What we are asked to do as education officers and with our data team is to take the pre-tests that come in and the post-tests and get this all into surmised reports for the teachers, some of which plays for or against the teacher, depending on the demographics in their class and their tests. Many times the students are tested before they've had 12 hours of realistic instructional time because the 12 hours can encompass the intake hours and the class time. So we do have students who have walked away because they did intake on Friday and their class starts Monday and they walk in and they're told I need to post test you. So they've not seen a teacher to even say what is my range or what do I have to work with so I know my improvement. Then it comes to data and we're told to enter this in to create the reports which are done by schematic and math within the software and sometimes the reports are dismal because this is what we have given to us. So it's a loaded gun in terms of it's weighted more for whom is what and how you have to ask it. The data teams are to be the magicians in terms of trying to get this done, but it's unrealistic for the students. The students get discouraged because it's test and it's a test and it's a test. And what we have to do is we have to save our program. We have to realistically be more accountable so that we look at our students not as just the number that's going to get us the epi dollar because they sit in that class, but we have to look at the students as that person striving, trying to create and reach a goal, and that's what we're there for. Thank you. Very good and very succinct and very informative. I appreciate it. And those were some of the, um, the, there was some of the information I was trying to get from the DOE earlier it was on that testing, right? And that's what I was referring to. Yes. So thank you for that. It's very, very informative. And thank you to this whole panel. I wish we didn't have to rush as much as we do, but I do have one more panel I need to bring up. Mm. So I appreciate all of you coming in. Okay. Okay, our next panel, Ira Yankwit, Literacy Assistance Center. Uh, Kevin Douglas, from United Neighborhood Houses. Elaine Roberts, Catholic Charities, Community Services. Amy Torres, Chinese American Planning Council, and Martha Boardman, uh, OACE ESL teacher. Yeah. Why don't we do Martha first? Where's Martha? Okay, because then you, it'll be with, uh, consistent with what the other teachers were saying, and then we'll go into service providers.
question. Hey, would you all raise your right hand, please, so I can swear you in? Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Okay, yes. Martha. Okay. Good afternoon, Councilman Drum and Educational Committee members. My name is Martha Boardman, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify on adult education in New York City. I was an ESL teacher in the New York City Office of Adult and Continuing Education until I retired in June 2014 with over 30 years of experience in the field of ESL adult education. I am here to test today to testify how the mission of the OACE is being undermined under the stewardship of Rosemary Mills, superintendent of the New York City OACE. OACE instructional staff understand that funds for the program are based on test score data gains. But for Superintendent Mills, the extraction of this data has little to do with improving educational outcomes. Instead, this so-called good data is used to embellish her profile. Superintendent Mills continuously harangues teachers and support staff to produce these data gains. In other words, to basically squeeze good data out of students by testing them over and over again. This, of course, has demoralized students. The principals and assistant principals are also under pressure to show test score gain, so they in turn harass teachers about test scores. I have a 2013 email from my principal that exemplifies the kind of threats and pressure teachers received then, but have heard from my in-service colleagues that this pressure has greatly intensified. It's in my packet. You'll receive it. At the end of spring 2014, at the end of the uh, spring 2014 term, Superintendent Mills decided to cut low-level literacy basic education in ESL students from the program since these students contribute to so-called bad data. As evidence, I have a memo from Superintendent Mills directing principals and assistant principals to send low-level students to adult education classes at local libraries. Never before had the OACE turned away low-level students. The administrative excuse for this decision was that library classes could better serve low-level literacy students. As an ESL low-level literacy teacher, I decided to follow up and was shocked to find out that the library where I was to refer my students did not even offer classes for low-level literacy students. On July 22, 2014, the online educational news publication Chalkbeat reported on this egregious directive in an article called Adult Students with Poor Literacy Getting Short Shrift, and I have a copy for you in here. Superintendent Mills and her expensive layer of elementary and middle school administrative appointees have tried to impose an elementary school curriculum for the teaching of adult ESL students. In fact, during the 2014 school year, large sums were squandered on children's textbooks with inappropriate elementary themes, for example, multiple picture books on animals. Instructional staff with a wealth of experience in ESL adult education had absolutely no input in selecting these materials, and Superintendent Mills told teachers that these elementary materials satisfied the goals of Common Core. Consequently, boxes and boxes of unused children's books were warehoused in adult education closets throughout the city that year while teachers were left with a dearth of uh, appropriate materials. At a 2013-14 OAC staff meeting, I attempted to ask Superintendent Mills a question about ESL materials, but was shut down. Superintendent Mills said all questions concerning materials should be directed to principals. Therefore, I emailed my questions to my principal. I also CC'd Superintendent Mills. My principal never wrote back, but Superintendent Mills did. I'd like to read you her email to me. I have my email to her. You can read it later. But here's her email to me. Ms. Boardman, it is clear that your agenda is not in the interest of the program. Rather, it is to ensure that the status quo continues. Please know that I am responsible for the leadership of OACE and will not tolerate anyone trying to undermine the program. Your conduct yesterday borders on unprofessionalism, and I caution you to desist and focus on providing instruction to your students. You are not a leader in OACE, so don't try to make leadership 
decisions. A couple of days later, my principal stopped my, by my room to give me a warning. She said there could be consequences for asking the superintendent questions. I strongly advise this committee to take a deep look at what is going on in the OACE. Well, very powerful. Uh, is your um, memo relating to the libraries the same as the one that Marsha had in her packet? Uh, the the, the Can you have, do, you, do you have the, um, the memo on the library funding? I don't have the memo on the library funding, but there was a, a library set up for teachers before. No, but I mean, and Marsha mentioned that there was a memo. I think it was in Marsha's. Yes, I have that memo. Yeah, it's in your testimony? Yes, it's in my testimony. Actually, okay. it's attached to the article from Chalkbeat. Okay, okay, all right, very good. Yeah. Okay, good. I just want to be sure that I have that as well. All right, thank you very much. You're and I think that that is the end of our teacher. And I, let me say this as well. I have never had a hearing where so many teachers have turned out on an issue as we have had here. So uh, we are definitely going to be looking at this issue more thoroughly as we move forward. So thank you to the teachers who have turned out for this. You're welcome. Now let's go to our service providers and where should we start? Kevin, you want to start? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Douglas. I'm co-director of policy and advocacy with United Neighborhood Houses of New York. I want to thank the chair and members of the committee for convening this important hearing on adult education in New York City. I uh, just want to quickly um, off, off my formal testimony commend the teachers that testified this morning. I'm not in a position to weigh the, the validity of the claims, but it's really inspiring to see such passionate educators come out and advocate for their students. And I think we all share the same goal of wanting a quality education system for adult winners in New York City. So my network is nonprofit settlement houses that are in the five boroughs. We have 30 agencies that serve three quarters of a million New Yorkers every year. Over two-thirds of those agencies are providing adult literacy services to about 10,000 students. Uh, that includes ESOL, ABE, HSC, as well as testing. Uh, we are longtime members of the New York City. Let me just interrupt you. Uh, cultural affairs uh, hearing has been moved next door just to make sure that everybody who's here in the room knows that this is the Education Committee hearing. Cultural affairs has been moved next door. Thank you. Go ahead, Kevin. I'm sorry. I, I thought all these folks were interested in adult education. So, like I said, I'm, I'm a member of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy. We've been a longtime partner and leader in that group, which is consisting of teachers, program managers from the CBO sector, as well as CUNY campuses and library chapters, our branches. And we're committed to seeing a system of adult education that's high quality and accessible for the 2.2 million New Yorkers who need those services. Uh, we are really grateful, thanks to your leadership as a longtime supporter of IOI, as well as uh, uh, Chair of the Immigration Committee, Carlos Manchaca, Speaker Mark Viverito, and uh, Finance Chair Ferris Copeland for really putting adult education back on the map in City Council discussions, and in particular for the $12 million investment that's made in each of the last two years. Uh, that's made a huge difference in terms of capacity for the system, although we know we're still seriously underfunded in terms of where the actual need is. Um, for today, we're not going to focus so much on the need question as much as the bill that has been presented uh, by uh, Immigration Chair uh, Menchaca. And I guess I would say we support the idea and the concept of the bill. We know there's a huge unmet need in the city and there's not a lot of good data to really mark progress in terms of if the city makes an investment, how far are they moving the needle. Uh, as a field, we've done self-surveys over the years. and. Our most recent survey, we found that at any point in time, there was over 15,000 students who were on waiting lists to get into classes, which was consistent with the survey we'd done two years prior and found 14,000 students on wait lists. Uh, this was an anecdotal survey responded to by a portion of the field, so we know it was only scratching uh, true demand. So for that reason, we really support the goal of this legislation, which would to be do a, a more comprehensive data capture on the number of people trying to access services. Uh, the one concern we have is, is really around uh, the administrative burden that this would place on programs. Uh, we know that programs are seriously underfunded as is. We, we heard uh, Councilman Rosenthal talk about the $850 that programs are getting to support their students, which is really well below what it needs to be. And so there's a concern that if we add on additional data reporting, capturing without 
uh, appropriate funding, it's going to be a nightmare, really, for the programs to administer. And so we support the idea and would want to work further with this committee and, and the bill sponsor to find ways to reduce that burden or, uh, in, a, in a more preferable solution, actually work to increase funding rates for programs so they can actually capture the data as requested. Um, the last two things I'll say is part of the challenges that we've heard this morning and I've articulated are due to the fact that there's no coordinated central leadership in the city on adult literacy. Uh, we have a variety of different providers, whether it's OACE or CBOs or libraries or CUNY or WorkDev or HRA, each doing their own piece of adult literacy and there's no central coordinator. We've been advocating for a long time that the Mayor's Office of Adult Literacy be uh, restored and, and renewed with the mission of bringing together all of these stakeholders, including teachers and students, to really create a vision for the system that would include comprehensive funding, access, and high quality for students. Uh, last thing, um, going back to the $12 million investment, we we're very grateful for that. Uh, the biggest challenge for us is that it wasn't baselined, which means it's one-year funding, which makes it incredibly hard for programs to expand uh, and not know if they're going to be able to retain those teachers in the, the following year, support students. So we'd ask that this council work with administration in the next budget to, at a minimum, baseline that funding and actually negotiate a new RFP. We heard DYCD say that they extended the current RFP for three years, which makes it very difficult to enter into negotiations for rates. We can't wait three years for the new rates, and so we want the funding baselined and new RFPs to be able to address that concern. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, please. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elaine Roberts. I'm the director of Catholic Charities ESOL program, uh, the International Center. We serve as an important resource for all the clients of Catholic Charities. Um, we work with um, refugee resettlement clients, help them in obtain employment. We work with clients from Immigration Legal Services, help them obtain citizenship. Um, we work with parents in the Alianza Dominicana after school programs. Um, and we provide English practice for children in the unaccompanied minors programs. Um, our goal is to provide the language skills and the confidence necessary for English language learners to communicate effectively in their personal, professional, and academic lives in New York City. Um, our programming includes ESOL classes at multiple proficiency levels, citizenship preparation classes, computer skills classes, um, individual conversation practice, and then specialized off-site programming um, for vulnerable communities in Manhattan and the Bronx. We are also an active member of the uh, New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy. Um, we are honored to testify today at the hearing alongside education advocates and um, colleagues and um, before the New York City Committee on Education whose commitment to adult literacy we appreciate. Um, just a word about Catholic Charities. Um, we serve all New Yorkers, Catholic and non-Catholic alike, throughout the five boroughs and seven counties in the Lower Hudson Valley. Um, our work is broad, diverse, and focused on responding to individual needs. Um, some of the services that we provide to New Yorkers include eviction prevention, case management um, to help people access benefits and solve financial and family issues, emergency food, specialized assistance for the blind and visually impaired, after school dropout prevention and employment programs for low income um, at risk youth, um, sports and recreation programs, and supportive housing for adults with mental illness. Um, we provide these programs throughout the city in um, our own centers and then in um, partnership and collaboration with other community resources. Um, we, our department, the ESOL department, is part of the Division of Immigrant and Refugee Services, which includes Immigration Legal Services, Refugee Resettlement, Unaccompanied Minors, and then the New Americans Hotline. Um, about Introduction 1195, um, I just wish to say thank you again um, for your time and attention to this issue. Um, as you know, there is a great unmet demand for adult literacy classes. Um, we do truly appreciate the $12 million investment this year. Um, as Kevin mentioned, um, there are still students that cannot find seats. Um, we based that on a, a survey that was done uh, a few years ago by NICAL. Um, continuing to support adult li literacy and baselining the funding would be helpful for programs to strengthen their services. Um, we support the goal of 1195 to more clearly show the demand and the need for adult literacy services. Um, and again, to echo what Kevin said, we feel strongly that the reporting mechanism must include data that is easy for programs to access and to report on, especially if there's not going to be additional funding to support the data collection. Um, 
our recommendation is to increase in baseline the adult literacy funding and to develop the proposed report. Um, the collaboration, the report should be developed in collaboration with the adult literacy programs, ideally through a task force drawn from providers and advocates in the field. Um, and this would help us to include the most useful information, um, I, most of many identified in the proposal and also with feedback from people in the field. Um, in addition, we feel that an accurate report on adult literacy must include data about students who have not yet come into contact with programs because of lack of awareness, fear about their status or other concerns. Um, information from other city agencies, such as HRA and MOYA and other, um, should be considered, and as well as the neighborhood advisory boards that are mentioned in DYCD's um, community assessment, needs assessment. Um, and thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you very much also. Next, please. Okay, good afternoon and thank you, uh, Chairperson good Tom afternoon. and members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Ira Yanklet and I'm the Executive Director of the Literacy Assistance Center, a 34-year-old nonprofit organization dedicated to strengthening and expanding the adult education system and to advancing adult literacy as a core value in our society and a foundation for equal opportunity and social justice. As this committee is well aware, and as Kevin mentioned earlier, today in New York City there are approximately 2.2 million adults who lack English language proficiency, a high school diploma, or both. Yet funding for adult literacy education is so limited that fewer than 4% of these adults are able to access basic education, high school equivalency, or English language classes in any given year. This is nothing short of a citywide crisis. And I wish to express deep appreciation to the City Council for recognizing the urgency of this crisis over the past two years and championing a significant increase in funding for programs. New York City has historically been a national leader, both in its vision for adult literacy education and in its level of investment. Your commitment over these past two years and the bill before us today demonstrate that this council, once again, wants to place New York City at the forefront of the movement for adult literacy and is striving to create a city that truly provides equal educational opportunity for all. The field of adult literacy education faces two acute challenges. One, a chronic shortage in funding, and two, the complexity of meeting an overwhelming need. Intro 1195 is an important step in beginning to address the latter. With stronger data, we can better understand gaps in our adult literacy system, particularly how many individuals are being turned away from city-funded programs each year and why. One way to facilitate this process would be for the city to fund a citywide adult literacy hotline, as it did from the mid-1980s through the early 2000s, which could track interest and demand and make, make referrals to programs that have seats and maintain a centralized waiting list that could direct potential students to programs when space becomes available. However, without additional funding for programs, both the ability to meet the added burden of Intro 1195's data collection responsibilities, as well as the ability to serve more of those adults seeking classes will be severely limited. For this reason, I'd like to focus the remainder of my testimony on some of the critical funding challenges faced by the field. Understanding these challenges at the start of this process will help to inform the city's vision for strategic investments and better ensure the success of this legislation's intent. When it comes to funding for adult literacy education, there are really three issues. The first is the paucity of the funding itself, which shuts the door to over 95% of those adults in need. The second is the short-term and unreliable nature of the current funding streams, which pose a continuous threat to program stability, staff continuity, and the ability to fully achieve program and policy goals. The third is the, inadequacy of the is the inadequacy of the funding formulas and rates, which undermine programs' ability to provide the full, ray, a full array and levels of service that students need. And it's this third issue that I'd like to discuss a bit more. The Literacy Assistance Center, my organization, is currently in the process of completing a report entitled Investing in Quality, a Blueprint for Adult Literacy Programs and Funders. The report was funded by DYCD as part of the LAC's contract to provide technical assistance to the field and is designed to answer two questions, and really two questions that were posed to us by the Budget Committee last year when it was looking at the increase in funding. First question, what are the defining features of a quality community-based adult literacy program? Second question, what does it cost to run one? After reviewing the literature and engaging in extensive discussions with program leaders and other stakeholders, the report identified 14 components of a comprehensive high quality community-based adult literacy program as well as the resources needed to implement them. It also includes a sample budget for a hypothetical but realistic program. Based on our cost model, we found that community-based adult literacy programs would need to have their current funding rates increased by three to six times in order to fully implement the components and services outlined in the report. 
While this might sound like a big leap, we know that at the current funding rates, many of the critical co program components that we identify in our report, such as full-time teachers, counseling, referral networks, workforce transition services, and in-depth data analysis are often compromised. The Mayor and City Council have shown a principled commitment to the children of New York City and have rightfully made necessary, substantial, and meaningful investments in our K-12 system. However, for the one in three New Yorkers in need of adult literacy education, we need to make sure that New York City does not become a tale of two education systems. At the Literacy Assistance Center, we envision a future in which every immigrant, every parent, and every adult in this city has the full range of knowledge and skills they need to secure employment, achieve economic security, access quality health care, support their children in school, and actively participate in the civic lives of their communities. We look forward to working with the City Council and in partnership with NICA, which we're also a, um, a partner and member of over the weeks and months ahead to secure increased funding to serve many more of the 2.2 million New Yorkers in need, as well as to baseline more adult literacy and funding to ensure greater program stability and continuity and to increase the funding rates for programs in order to guarantee that every adult who gains access to a program is given the comprehensive, high-quality services they deserve. In a city committed to equal opportunity and social justice, we can do no less. Thank you again, and I'm happy to take any questions. Just curious to know, if someone were to call 311 and ask for adult literacy, what would, what would happen? So that's an excellent question. So as I mentioned, um, from the late 80s through the early 2000s, there was an adult literacy hotline. It was multilingual. People would call specifically to access services, and they'd be directed by knowledgeable operators to programs. Um, that ended with the creation of 311 under the Bloomberg administration. Um, I have to say I have not called 311 to ask in a while. I know that um, early on, 311 would direct to the Office of Adult and Continuing Education. But I think the problem there is that they don't necessarily have knowledge of the full range of programs. And they're also, maybe more significantly, not trained in how to actually talk through someone who's taking um, the very big step of calling and inquiring about programs, whether they're an immigrant who speaks very little English, or whether they're someone who just barely reads and writes. So it's not just an issue of making sure that they're referred to the range of programs, but really the quality of the interaction with the call. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you, and thank you for coming to testify today and sharing your information. It was interesting. I asked um, the representative of DYCD today about whether or not, you know, just sort of getting to the point of your study. And um, I'm glad to hear that they asked you to do a study. Um, I didn't see any indication from this particular representative that they're interested in changing the um, contracts that they've just renewed. Um, but perhaps, let's assume he's not representative of being able to make that decision. Um, I just want to confirm I'm hearing three things from your testimony. First, that we're not First, that we're addressing the need of 5% of the population. Fewer than that, but yes. Second, that despite the fact that these are three-year contracts, DYCD seem to indicate, there's still problems with program stability. Yes, in so much as, as, as you asked and are alluding to, that the funding, the current funding rates for those programs really don't cover even the full cost of what they're doing now. Got they have to be supplemented, much less the full cost of really providing the kind of comprehensive program that they seek to fund and provide. So tell me about, um, and your findings are extraordinary, I mean, the idea that it's three to six times the $850 per student they currently give is, um, meaningful. Um, what's the nature of your contract with DYCD in terms of moving uh, them? Take When do they get your findings and have they talked about their commitment, any commitment, any interest to change? So this is a very timely question. So um, the way, and I just want to go back for one moment to the 5% question. So um, I, it's more like 4%, and that's uh, an, an estimate based on data we have of all the adults who are being served through the wide range of programs that you've heard about today, the CBOs, CUNY, the libraries, um, the Department of Education. Um, 
and we're saying 4% of the 2.2 million adults that we know are in need, and we have hard data to support that 2.2 million. Um, in terms of DYCD, so the way this this report was funded is that as DYCD's technical contracted technical assistance provider to the adult literacy programs with the increased funding that you secured for the programs last year part of that came to us to expand our technical assistance services and I think it's worth noting that it was DYCD itself who saw value in having us engage in this process knowing that the overwhelming likelihood would be that we would come back to them with the report that stated that funding is grossly inadequate. So I, I do want to recognize yep. that, and Rong Zhang, who was here earlier, um, is our principal partner at DYCD. Sure. Um, the, the, the report is currently in the process of going through finalization. We're actually meeting with DYCD leadership on Monday. So. Um, to be fair, you know, it has not been finalized and released sure. yet, nor has DYCD leadership had a chance to, to comment on it. Um, but, you know, I think that I, I appreciate DYCD um, for their willingness to open up this conversation um, to to subject themselves to the finding of this report and you know the the presumed pressure that will be on them um, certainly we as part of NICAL plan to share more of this with you in the budget process to argue that it's not just about baselining the $12 million, but dramatically increasing the reimbursement rates so programs can provide the services that they need. So. I appreciate that, and I'll definitely ha include me on your mailing list I'd for be that. I'd delighted. Thank you. Um, the only thing, other thing I would ask is, um, uh, sorry, I forgot, middle-aged metal. That's not understood. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, next, please, uh, Amy, uh, Amy Torres. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Chair Drum and members of the Committee on Education. My name is Amy Torres. I'm representing the Chinese American Planning Council, Inc., CPC's Education and Career Services. On behalf of CPC, thank you for today's invitation, and thank you for hearing the importance of adult literacy programs and the introduction of 1195. Founded in 1965, CPC's mission has been to promote social and economic empowerment of Chinese American, immigrant, and low-income communities. As the largest Asian American social services agency in the United States, CPC provides culturally sensitive programs for all ages. CPC currently serves over 8,000 people per day through 50 plus contracted programs in 30 more locations in Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. CPC serves over 800 English for Speakers of Other Languages students per year in our adult literacy program. Adult literacy is key to our mission's promotion of social and economic empowerment. Our students are parents and grandparents. They are prospective college students or on their way toward gaining their high school equivalency. They're entering the workforce for the first time or they're making the next step in their career. And they are recent immigrants and aspiring citizens and longtime voters. Each student enters our program with a different goal, but every student depends on adult literacy programming in order to achieve it. We're thrilled and grateful that the city's inclusion of $12 million for adult literacy programs this year recognizes how integral these services are to New Yorkers achieving their dreams, and we're grateful to see the introduction of a bill like 1195. Introduction 1195 would compile and report the number of adult literacy programs offered by the city, the number of people who applied for those classes, and the number who were denied admission due to entrance exam score or program capacity. CPC is happy to see the introduction of a bill that recognizes the need and demand for adult literacy programs across the city, and we support Introduction 1195's broad goal of capturing, validating, and addressing that need. Each year, CPC's wait list exceeds the total number of students we offer in a year. Last year, the number of people on our wait list was nearly double the amount that we have capacity for, and in the last six months, our demand has been so high that nearly all of our enrolled students have come either from our wait list or via word of mouth referral from existing students. While we recognize the value and need for formally capturing this unmet demand for adult literacy programs and the number of services addressing that demand, we raise concern over the phrasing of the methods proposed. Specifically, requiring programs to report on the methods of any literacy test and number who were denied admission based on a literacy exam seems to shift the focus of the bill's goal away from capturing unmet demand toward additional reporting from programs. 
Capturing methods of literacy tests suggests that a standardized entrance method could further meet demand. However, as you heard in testimony earlier today, programs are already required to use standardized tests like Best Plus or the Test of Adult Basic Education TABE to enroll a student in a contract. Additionally, students are rarely waitlisted or turned away because of exam scores. Rather, these preliminary benchmarks assess whether or not there's an available class at the schedule that they'll need. Um, CPC reiterates its support for this bill's goal of capturing the number of students offered by the city and the number of people who applied but were unable to enroll. We have seen that the demand in our program um, and fully support a mechanism that captures how the need is being met across the city. To address our concerns, we would like to see the bill's language amended to exclude denied admission based on literacy exam and the testing methods of any literacy test used to evaluate applicants. CPC, in coordination with other providers under the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy, is happy to consult on reporting that would be least burdensome to both the program and student alike, while still accurately capturing the unmet demand. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And Councilmember Rosenthal, I know, has some follow-up questions. Two quick questions. Are you folks members of the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee? Yeah. So your issues, are, you're part of the working group. Okay, and um, yes, but just to clarify, adult literacy is not a, a major topic of conversation within those committees. As you talked about the module budgeting earlier, adult literacy is on the immediate schedule. So we're part of the committee, and we appreciate your questioning, and would encourage further questioning that adult literacy had greater prominence in the work of that group. Good. The next steps. Thank you. Okay. All right. That's it. Um, I appreciate all of you coming in. I especially appreciate you, the last panel, waiting uh, to give testimony. I uh, much appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to reviewing the, um, what has been said here and bringing these, atten these issues to the attention of Councilmember Menchaca in particular regarding the legislation. So uh, with that, I'm going to say that this meeting is adjourned at about 1.37 in the afternoon. Thank you.